All right, hello everybody. I'd like to welcome you all. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Clerk Allison, could we have a roll call, please? Trustee Donnersberger. Here. Trustee Eck. Here. Trustee Farrell Mayer. Here. Trustee Kennedy. Absent. And Trustee Metz. Here. And Trustee O'Loughlin. And she, she's absent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We could all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of Allegiance. All right, again, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to this meeting. Uh, we have agendas up front. We also have a sign-in sheet, if you wouldn't mind signing in. Hello, Sean. I oh. okay. uh, want to remind everybody also that we are broadcasting this meeting on um, YouTube, and then that goes to uh, Facebook Live, and then we record the meeting, and that's on the website, so somebody could view that later. Oh, and uh, Channel 6 for everybody local in town on Comcast. Uh, first thing on the agenda is the uh, mayor's report. Uh, in the village sidewalk master plan, which David has just put an image up, and there's a poster here in front, um, try to do this update every month. The areas that you can see in blue, or the lines in blue, are what's existing in the village, and the red lines are what the village board has approved for the master sidewalk plan. So the first one up is Acacia Drive, and for those who are in the area, you know that the south end of Acacia has recently been done, and the northern part will be done the first part of next year. Uh, Plainfield and Wolf Road are both county roads, and they are both in phase one study right now. Uh, we are expecting to have Wolf Road alternatives uh, for sidewalks and or pedestrian paths available in early 2022. And uh, of course, we will want resident review and comments on that. Uh, Joliet Road, we're still working with our legislators and the Village of Countryside for a sidewalk on both sides of Joliet Road. Uh, next up is Acacia Drive update. Uh, this project has encountered uh, several issues causing delays and changes to our schedule, uh, but the southern section of the roadway is done. The midpoint is almost out in front of Village Hall and the northern section will be done uh, next year, starting early. And the landscaping and finishing touches will be the last thing to be done. And I believe this board is committed to making it look uh, good when we are done. Uh, last uh, update is the 294 tollway. Uh, the on-ramp from Joliet Road to 294 is expected to be done in November. Uh, the tollway construction through Indiana Park will last several more years. And please note the southern half of the sound wall between Joliet Road and Plainfield will be uh, removed and then replaced next summer. Uh, in the last month, uh, I have attended uh, two events with John DeRocher, the chief of police, and others uh, on the village board. Uh, one was a senior breakfast at Wilshire Green, and the other was a coffee and donuts with the mayor. And I wanted to pass some of the feedback that I received uh, to the board and to the community. Uh, there was an interest in a dog park to be added in town. Uh, people like the October smoke signals. Uh, that was the one that kind of had a table of contents on the first page. A couple residents commented that they liked that. And then at the coffee and donuts, a young couple pushed a baby stroller to the Heritage Center and they thought the idea of a sidewalk along Wolf Road would be great. And lastly, uh, I would like to ask and suggest that every resident should sign up on our website about getting 
uh, village information. If you put in your name and uh, email address, you can get uh, email updates on any stories or articles that are of interest to you. You get to pick uh, what you want. And then later tonight, we'll hear about a new app called Simplicity, and that will be another option to get updates. Okay, it's at this point in the meeting that we have uh, public comments. If you want to make a comment, if you could please come to the podium and state your name, that would be great. Anybody want to make a comment? Okay, I don't see anybody coming. And this, so you know, there is another point uh, at the end of the meeting. Yes, sir, come on up. Mr. Mayor, trustees, good evening. My name is Ed Hill from Kowski. I've been an employee of this village for over 30 years and a resident for almost as many. And I know in this meeting they're going to speak about the mandate for vaccination. Is that correct? I just want to state that I'm not anti-vax. However, I believe it should be the individual's choice, not the government's, whether it be federal, state, county, or local. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Chris? <laughs> Officer Chris Gardner, 16 years with the village. First, I would like to thank the board for allowing us to speak tonight. I hope that my words are not falling on deaf ears as I have canceled the trip where I was supposed to be in San Diego celebrating the Marine Corps birthday with my, my uh, brothers that I served with and uh, Veterans Day. To all the veterans here, thank you for your service. During the past two years of the pandemic, I have only missed six days of work, four when COVID took my mother, and two when my wife had symptoms, we played it safe by getting tested. I know the risk. I've had many debates with my fellow officers who felt we should get hazard pay for coming to work during the pandemic. I explained that we knew the risk when we took this job. And as you know, no requests have ever been brought to this board for any kind of stipends. I am not against the shot. If anyone here could legitimately convince me that by me getting the shot, I could protect another, I would have done so. I've dedicated my life to the protection of others. We have learned in the past few months that the shot does not stop the spread. There are fully vaccinated officers on this department who, ha who have contracted the corona. What might, we, what might we learn in a few more months? President Biden speaks to how effective the shot is in preventing major illness and hospitalization. He said then, this is, and I quote, this is not about freedom. What, you're free to kill me with your corona? Unquote. Common sense would dictate that if you're fully vaccinated and it's so effective, then how can an unvaccinated person kill you with their corona? For me, a Marine, it is about freedom. I am against the mandate. Every law that has been written, if found to be unconstitutional, could be amended or repealed. The reason Illinois is no longer a death penalty state is because the government is fallible. But once a subject is dead, it cannot be undone. Once a shot is in the arm, it cannot be taken out. As a law enforcement officer for nearly 16 years with this village, I live in a world where life or death decisions sometimes might need to be made within milliseconds. The law provides certain expectations, or I'm sorry, exceptions when dealing with exigency. In my mind, I can't see how this decision pr proves this standard. As the vaccine's been available for 11 months, and this decision won't even be voted on for another month. I also deal with precedents. This mandate is unprecedented. To say yes to this is setting a precedent that all the future Fauci's, Biden's, Trump's, or worse, can tell our grandchildren that they have no say in their medical decisions. If we don't have freedom in our own person, in our own cells that make us up, does freedom exist? I'm not asking the board to not create and not enforce a mandate. I'm asking the board to allow time for the systems that have been created to ensure that the government protects our people and our liberties to work. If anyone on the board would like to have further dialogue on this topic with me, I know I only have three minutes. Many of you have my cell phone number and I would be happy to discuss this further. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Mike? Good evening. My name is Mike Kernick. I've been an employee here for many years, but that has nothing to do with this. 
I'm going to make it simple. Everything Chris said, I agree with. And there's nothing more I can add to that right now. Maybe next meeting I will. But thank you again. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Nick? I, I'm here on another matter tonight, but uh, hearing the officers speak, I feel compelled to speak as a resident of Indian Head Park. Uh, Nick Tubox, 6520 Pontiac. Um, you know, as a small community, if the village is weighing these kind of uh, uh, mandates and whatnot, I think we should think clearly about uh, there's not a real long line of people wanting to be officers in general in this world. Um, our police is a great police force here. I, they've done great things for us, our family, our community. So uh, hearing them out is great. Thank you all for your service as well in town. Um, if we're going to be pushing these uh, mandates through and such, I think you guys should think really hard about it because uh, a lot of cities are losing valuable public works employees, public employees over these types of matters, and they have to be carefully vetted, carefully thought through. And um, I think uh, seeing what the government's going to keep doing and how they're going to keep push pushing these uh, decisions or there might be pullbacks in these decisions, I think it's very incumbent upon the public body to really take their time in, in rendering these decisions and votes on things like this. So I just encourage you all as village uh, board and, and uh, directors here to carefully consider those mandates uh, before pushing through a decision. So I support the uh, decision that people make for themselves one way or the other. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any other? Oh, Andy, yep. Well, uh, sometimes we get emails that are sent in, so Andy's got a couple of those. Yeah, I have, I have two, Mayor. Um, first one is from resident Sharon Kalinowski. Uh, she says, hello, I am unable to attend meetings in person because when people of the audience are speaking to the board, they're not wearing masks inside Village Hall. Uh, she also says, I have a suggestion for smoke signals. It has been published quarterly, which, has, which was not often enough. Now it is monthly, which seems too frequent. How about publishing it every other month instead? Also, I'd like to see it remain as a printed mail newsletter. That's the first one. And then the second one is from resident uh, Dale Holmquist. She says, uh, as you know, I strongly favor positive triangle development that will enhance our community, uh, not the development of individual plats. Many residents have encouraged the board to focus on and follow the original PUD for family-friendly family multi-use development per the village's original plan. Why consider adding more retail space when there's already 2,700 square feet available at the old ombudsman site, unoccupied retail by Guy Blando, more vacant space at the hair salon, and even more at the suites. Empty storefronts are considered a negative within any community. Why consider new retail when there is a considerable amount of unoccupied, unoccupied space now available? Based on oversupply, I urge you not to approve the new retail building. Not only is the design footprint and parking lot tight, it will create a traffic bo bottleneck and already at an already congested intersection. No one can predict how much land will be taken during the Wolf Road expansion, which could reduce the parcel size further. Please take these factor into, factors into your decision and vote against this. Ask yourself, is this the highest and best use for this land? Thank you. Thank you, That's Andy. All. All right, uh, any other comments? And again, a reminder, there is another public comments at the end of the meeting, but I don't see any other hands or movement. All right, thank you all. Um, we're gonna move on to the first item, the consent agenda. Would somebody like to make a motion on the consent agenda? I make a motion to approve the consent agenda as established. I'll second. Thank you, Eileen and Sean. Anybody have any questions about the items in the consent agenda or comments? Maureen, are you uh, able to do a financial report? At the end of September, cash on hand was 3.4 million. Warrants for the month were 600,000. Of particular, two large warrants were for the 2014 road bond issue for about 185,000 and 26,000 in sewer televising and repair. Revenues for the month were a million with an ending balance of 3.8 million. 
Thank you. Uh, John, could you give a quick update on the rejection of single bid vehicle repair, please? Village staff um, put out for bid um, a repair, uh, repairs for our fleet. Uh, we were hoping to have a single vendor uh, to do maintenance on our vehicles. Uh, we got one bid from Rosh Ford in Bensonville, and we feel that that is too far out of our way. It's about a half hour away, so it's an hour easy each uh, round trip plus repair time. So uh, I would like the board to reject the bid, and then we will regroup and see where we can to find a vendor locally or closer for vehicle repair. Right now, we have a mismatch of, of shops that do work for us, and I would like to have a single unified uh, firm do, do our work. Thank you. All right, last chance for the board. Any questions or comments? Sean? Yeah, uh, John, just so I understand. So th that was the only bid that came in? There was Correct. nothing local? No, nothing local. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Clerk Allison, could we have a roll call vote, please? Trustee Donnersberger. Aye. Trustee Kennedy. Just for clarification, an aye means that we're rejecting the bid, correct? Yes. Well, it's the whole consent agenda that you're approving everything. That's oh. part of the consent agenda. Mm -hmm. Aye. Uh, Trustee Eck. Aye. Trustee Farrell Mayer. Aye. Trustee Metz. Aye. And Trustee O'Loughlin, who is absent. Thank you. All right, that has been approved. Thank you. We'll go to new business. The uh, first item A, camera project presentation. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, mayor, trustees. Thank you for uh, seeing my glasses. <laughs> Much better. As you know, we've been working on uh, a camera system throughout the village for the last several months. Um, I'm here tonight to present an overview of that project and what's been going on from when we started up until today. Um, yeah. Could I ask if anybody has questions on the board, do you want them saved to the end or are you okay being interrupted? I don't care either way. It doesn't matter to me. Whatever, you, whatever floats your boat, I'm good with it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so uh, as we started out, we, uh, as every project, there was a team put together in regards to these cameras, a team consisting of uh, Trustee O'Loughlin, myself, Mike Kernick, my deputy chief, and of course my boss, John DeRocher, uh, the village manager. Um, why, are we, why do we want cameras? Why does the village want cameras? Well, prior to my arrival here, the village had already uh, shown an interest in wanting cameras throughout the village. Uh, so then once uh, Chief Cervenka left and then I was brought in, it was kind of in the transition. So I went ahead and we grabbed the ball and we started running with it. So with the significant, as the PowerPoint says, with the significant rise in crime, especially with crimes of opportunity that is coming out here to the western suburbs of Chicago, with the technological advances in security cameras, the Village of Indian Head Park's leadership has a desire to place stationary cameras throughout the village at designated locations as a crime deterrent and to help solve criminal activity. The objective of this project is to select a camera vendor that best meets the village needs and expectations, but yet may not be the lowest bidder. As we have seen from the various vendors that have been in to talk to us and show us their products and past history with government and choosing always the lowest bidder, sometimes the lowest bidder doesn't work out very well due to quickness of a project, due to cheapness of, of whatever it may be. So. We definitely want to pick the right vendor that this village needs, but not necessarily is going to be the lowest bidder. So how will the system be used? Um, primarily, we're looking at capturing license plate information and reviewing vehicle information after a crime has been committed. Our main focus here was to, originally it was to capture license plates and vehicles as they came through the community, and if we 
had an issue where we had a rash of vehicle burglaries, say in a certain neighborhood throughout the hours of one to four o'clock in the morning, we could narrow it down. We can go back and review vehicles that had driven through the village between those hours, start running license plates and try to give us some information in regards to who's been poking around and who's been driving through the village. It's just a way of, of helping us solve uh, crimes that would occur. Um, the license plates, uh, it's very important because, as I said, crimes that occurred, if we don't have this camera information, if we don't have these plates, and we have a rash of burglaries, and we have absolutely nothing to go on, the chances of, of solving any crimes could be uh, very low. But with these cameras, crime, the, the solvability rate increases. And I'm just using burglary as a pulled it out of air. God forbid anything more serious happens in regards to a home invasion, in regards to any, a homicide or anything like that. It helps us to better our chances to solve a crime that may have been commuted, committed within the town. Uh, these camera companies now have what's called LPRs, license plate readers. As cars are coming through the communities, they're running the license plate as they come. If a car is stolen, let's say for instance, we're going to get a notification immediately that this car is driving through town and that this is a reported stolen vehicle. This information can be shot out to a cell phone to the officers that are working out on the street to let them know that this car was at this location and it's reported stolen and give the license plate and the kind of car. So again, a great way to help us solve crime or deter it before it happens. How we won't use the system. We will not use the system to monitor people, monitor people that are coming in and out of the village on a, on a real-time basis. We're not gonna monitor our residents as they're coming at one o'clock in the morning if somebody's out drinking and they shouldn't have been and some spouse is gonna be a little upset with them when they get home, that's not gonna be our business. We are not gonna be looking real-time as cars are driving through. We don't have the staff, we don't have the, the manpower to do that. Um, but this is, uh, for the most part, it's for our police investigations. It's for if a crime is committed, we can go after the fact and try to work our way backwards and work an investigation. I, I do um, have a question about yeah. that. Since you mentioned drinking, <clears throat> uh, if somebody is coming home with uh, too many and they look like they're not driving properly, would that be noticed on the uh, cameras and addressed right away? Probably not, just because of the fact that we don't have, uh, we don't have a, the, the, uh, the camera does not record the vehicle for m many seconds. It just flashes the license plate there. there wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to determine whether or not the car was driving erratically or not. Okay, what are some of the reasons for uh, stationary cameras? Increased public safety. I mean, if you guys, if everybody watches the 10 o'clock news every night, pretty much, Every single crime that's ever been committed, there's a videotape of the person that did it, of the bad guy. It's rare to see the channel uh, 2 News, 5, 7, whatever, at 10 o'clock at night, telling about the robberies, the shootings, and that without having any kind of, some kind of video footage of it. Uh, it just doesn't happen because people are getting cameras. It increases public safety. We get a capture of the car, we get a capture of the person, we put their face out there on the news, the next thing you know, you're getting a phone call, hey, I know that guy, this is this so-and-so. We can go out there and make that arrest. Um, as I said, assisting and apprehending criminals, as I just covered. In doing so, we then have the ability to reduce the crime rate. Now, Village of Indian Head Park, uh, fortunately has a low crime rate, but these cameras are gonna make it, help us to make it even lower. And that's really what we're looking for. We're really looking to reduce the crime rate within the village, within the already low crime rate. We wanna make it super low, if you know what I'm saying. And community caretaking. Uh, the use of the camera gives us every available a resource to protect the community, and it's showing that the community that we care about them, the village cares about them, and we wanna do everything at our means and disposal to protect the citizens the visitors and the residents here in Indian Head Park. Excuse me. Now there are uh, surrounding community cameras are, are becoming very popular. Um, there are uh, the various surrounding communities that have cameras are listed here. As I've reached out to each one of these communities, I've spoken to their chiefs of police. 
I've gotten uh, the information in regards to the cameras that are within their communities. And as you can see, I've, I have the community, and then I have who the vendor is for their cameras, and then, of course, the total number of cameras. And I was really surprised at these total numbers. Countryside, uh, who has a vendor by the exit, they have 95 cameras throughout their town. Uh, we went through Countryside, we went into our Countryside, the chief uh, is a friend of mine and showed us his system and it's, it's very nice and it's very sharp, but they have 95 cameras per ridge. Uh, hey, are looking- I I'm think sorry. Eileen had a- Yeah, oh, I have a question. are these all security cameras or are some of them red light cameras? No, no, no red light cameras. Okay. All stationary security cameras. And I have a follow up from my previous question. So what exactly do the cameras capture? You said just the license plate? License plate and um, vehicle. What kind of vehicle it's, uh, it's on that so plate. So it's a snapshot, it's not like a video. Correct. Now, one of the vendors, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, John, but one of the vendors, Proven IT, has, their system is, they snap so many pictures so fast it actually creates a video. So there is video, it looks like it is video footage as they're catching it. I don't think anybody else had that. Everything else was a snapshot of the license plate and the car. Uh, now, not always the whole car. They can tell what kind of a make maybe, but not necessarily a model because we've had a couple, we've had um, Vigilant has had a camera up for about three weeks over on Acacia. And as I reviewed those things every few days to look at them, it, it's kind of odd the way they, they captured something. You get the plates on every single vehicle, but sometimes you get the whole vehicle, sometimes you get a quarter of the vehicle, a half of the vehicle. I don't understand the difference or why, because it's not speed, because <laughs> I've been testing it myself. I've been kind of jumping on, when nobody was around, I've been <laughs> jumping on the gas and going pretty quick, and then I've gone really slow, and uh, I look up my car, and it's like different each time, so I don't know what but the rhyme or reason. Every car that goes down the street gets captured, every single It's supposed car. to, yes. Let me comment on that. Uh, uh, the chief has uh, extended the invitation for members of the board to uh, look at the system from time to time. I took him up on that. We looked at the vigilant one. I had come in on Acacia, and of all the cars we saw, we never could see mine. <laughs> and it was, it, it should have been uh, pictured. Uh, I wasn't speeding. Yeah. And no, yeah, uh, yeah, we couldn't. So I'm not going to say. But, that. So any, anyhow, yeah. uh, to answer your question specifically, uh, it wasn't perfect, at least uh, on that case. Yeah, and I yeah, would and also encourage the other board members to uh, take a look at that. It, it also took quite a while to get to the screen to, to look at that as, uh, as well. Excuse me. Yeah, I believe what Trustee Egg was saying as far as uh, it took a while. He, he came into my office, and when I pulled up the vehicles, we kind of approximated the time he drove through, and the time hadn't caught up yet with the cameras when I was looking at it. It was about, was about 15, 20 minutes or something. That, Yeah, not even so. We had to wait for a while before they um, were able to ret ret retrieve plates from around the same time that Trustee Eck came rolling down the street. I'm sorry, I still have another question. So these communities, are those the kind of security cameras they have, the snapshots rather right. than videos? Right. They all have it. Okay. I'm curious, are any of those, yeah. I'm surprised Countryside has 97 cameras. Are some of yeah, those 95 is what the chief told me. Are yeah. on buildings, or are they all just traffic cameras? They're on a, no, all the, they're all the village cameras. So th those are also internal cameras as well for their facilities. You know, then they're, they're building, their municipal buildings and things like that. It's not all 95 cameras out on the street. Same we, with all these other vendors. It's, or, or villages, it's cameras on the street as well as internal cameras within their and buildings. are we looking at internal cameras as well? Or? That is an option in the bid, but the primary, primary focus of the bid is external on the street cameras. Well, because we have internal cameras today and we're one of the options, as John just said, is to replace those cameras. Okay. How many internal cameras do we have today approximately? Mike says six. How many, Mike? Six, 15. 15, okay, Thank 15. You. Um, now, as you see, Burr Ridge, uh, Burr Ridge is right now working with Flock to get some stationary cameras in their community. They have 48 cameras through a, a company called Bosch, but those are only in their subdivisions. It's not in any of their, ro their roads or things like that. Um, Hinsdale, they have uh, Vigilant as well as Pentegra. Now Pentegra, those are the internal cameras, their buildings and things like that. There's 67 Vigilant are the cameras they have out on the road, the intersections and things like that. Hodgkins, uh, they have a company called Milestone. They have 63 cameras out there in their community as well. And then Oakbrook, 
they are looking at vigilant. Right now, they only have four cameras uh, out there on the street, but they have milestone cameras for their facilities, and they have over 80 cameras uh, as well for, for their facilities. Uh, so that is, um, and the communities there on the bottom, they have no cameras yet. There are no plans as far as I know, LaGrange, Western Springs, and LaGrange. So Park. you've talked to them and they don't have plans, is that right? Not at this point in time. And how about uh, the state? Are there any directives? I, I believe body cameras have to be installed by 2025 or something like that. So has the state said anything about these kinds of cameras? No, not at all. Um, not to my knowledge, not, not one bit the state is not in it. The body camera is all police departments throughout the state have to have them by January 1st, 2025. And it's based on your population. So this, Jan this January 1st, Villages with say over uh, 250,000 people have to have them and then next year it's over 100,000 and so forth Village our size we have to have them by January 1 of 2025 And we have to have body cameras on our officers. That doesn't mean we can't have them sooner That's just the the, right. the, the mandate right now that we have to have them by Thank you The well, policy issues we need to consider if we're going to get these cameras um, We first of all we want to protect an anonymity and personal privacy. We want to, don't want to be mounting these cameras that are going to be peeking into people's backyards or going, you know, on the road. But then also, yeah, you can look through windows uh, of homes and, and, and things like that. So that's one of the things we'll be looking at. We want to respect people's private property. Uh, we want to ensure the preventions of any sort of discrimination. We don't want to be, um, you know, accused of being discriminatory. With the images that we capture because in nowadays world I mean you can do anything and it's discriminatory so we want to make sure that we fall uh, along the lines of doing the right thing uh, we're going to provide training and supervision of uh, user compliance uh, our officers will be able to um, as I said they will get messages on cars that uh, or suspects that may be driving cars that are questionable uh, where they will be trained on how to do that um, there will Officers will not have the rights to get into the system, though that'll be reserved for myself, the deputy chief, village manager, uh, and maybe one other officer, a senior OIC officer, and, that, and that's it. Others will not be allowed to have access to get into the internal system to manipulate or try to change or do anything with it. Um, we want to ensure evidence, one of the reasons we want it is because we want to ensure evidence quality and integrity. Too many hands get in the pot, then the state's attorneys get nervous when we want to try to uh, get charges and go to trial and things like that. So we want to make sure that we ensure the integrity, the chain of custody, things like that uh, when it comes to our images and, and, and capturing uh, and prosecuting the criminals. Freedom of Information Act compliance. We will be, there will, whoever, uh, our FOI officer, which currently is Mike, uh, he will be trained in proper FOI compliance. Uh, with uh, our videotapes as well, and of course, if John wants to, we can have one of the uh, the admin people, uh, somebody say Andy or someone also, to be an FOI officer as well. Um, but that would be we'll keep that also at a minimum. And the access will only be to authorized law enforcement personnel and or the village manager wants to dedicate a certain person outside of the police department. The physical attributes that we want to consider when putting up these cameras, uh, any pre-existing objects in which the cameras can be mounted on. We, of course, it's always best if we've got something up there that we can mount those cameras on, a light pole that's ours or, or whatever it is, anything we can do to mount those cameras to benefit will help us and make the cost cheaper so we don't have to have the camera companies put up poles and do digging and things like that. What are the best camera locations? Uh, I believe uh, the committee has designated some good camera locations that we feel very comfortable they can get, I'm not gonna say 100%, but we've got what we feel is the entire town located for anybody driving through or leaving uh, our village that wherever we would have the cameras placed. So we feel very comfortable with that. And uh, we've kind of worked hard at uh, putting the locations in, we've brainstormed and okay, here we go. And then the first time we picked out the locations and not knowing that cameras specifically cover one lane, so then we had to kind of update a little bit and change the locations around so we wouldn't have to add more cameras but keep the same amount of cameras but yet have the same coverage. Um, I, we want to make sure there's no objects obstructing the camera view that will need to be removed, trees and, 
and whatever offenses or whatever that may be. So we want to, uh, when we're scouting the locations, to make sure that's taken care of. Other agency approvals for camera locations, if uh, we need to get a town such as Countryside or Western Springs approval, if we feel a camera would need to go on their side of the, the property line, we want to make sure that we, uh, we get permission from them before we would move forward with that location. Do we need electricity? If we do, how is that going to be run to the location? Um, if the camera is able to view private areas, how will individual privacy rights be protected? Again, as we talk about that, we're always, that'll be one of the forefront issues is we want to respect people's privacy, we want to respect their rights, and we do not want to infringe on that one bit. And if the camera is exposed to the elements, how might it affect operation and longevity? And that's another thing is these vendors have come in and talked to us. Many of these cameras are solar powered. Uh, many of them have power. If they're solar powered, how long does the power last? We have dark, gloomy days here uh, in our area during the winter. Um, how effective is that solar power going to be? Are the batteries going to die? And the vendors are all over the spectrum, want for anywhere from three days to, to 15 days as far as solar power if they lose their solar power. So that will be another thing that we need to look at. Uh, and this is a good time of year to be looking at that. So, Chief, um, yeah. so this list of physical attributes to consider, and I guess also the policy issues, what's the plan to address those? Um, something like electricity, I would think if a system is requires electricity to the camera, that would be part of the evaluation when the bids come in, right? If somebody has solar versus a vendor who has electricity. Um, mm -hmm. So sure. how, how do you plan to address this list on these two pages? You know, are some being worked on now? Um, or, no. you know, will it be done after? No, it'll be, I'll be done after. Uh, it'll primarily be where we decide to, to find locations for each camera. Uh, we will have to then determine if, if solar will work. Because one of the vendors have said we have a lot of trees in town, especially going on Wolf Road. Uh, will the solar power be a, a good uh, option, or would electricity be much better? And then we would have to figure out how we're going to run the electricity. So once we determine, once we get up, once we pick our vendor, once you guys pick your vendor who you want to go with, then we will go out and we have the locations that we want, but we still may have to tweak those depending on what they say. Once they, we figure out exactly where those cameras are going to go, then we'll have to deal with solar power, electricity, existing poles, have to put poles in, things like that. So um, <clears throat> will these, to follow up on Tom's question, uh, these, there are some really important issues here, not just electricity, but privacy. Of, I mean, I can't even imagine putting a camera where it could... Uh, catch uh, somebody's private property. Um, and yeah. so I'm wondering if, as the bids come in, will they be required to address each one of these as part of the bid process so we can evaluate them on that? Uh, probably not, because once we, whoever we pick, this is just what they're going to have to abide by. Um, that's just the way it's going to have to be set up. Uh, nobody, to be honest with you, that's really not going to be an issue because if, if you would check out the, the footage, of the cameras that we get now from, from Vigilant, they really only just hones in right in on the plate and the car. You really can't see a whole lot more outside of the vehicle. And we're not looking at, and it's, it's right over here um, at the Cascade and Acacia. It's a wide intersection. And, but that, that camera just hones in on the plate. It hones in on some of the vehicle, and that's it. You're not seeing any grass. You're not seeing anybody's yard. You're not seeing a house in the background or anything like that. It, it's... It's something we want to say we're doing and protect, but to be honest with you, in reality, it's really not an issue. Well, it's something that we not just want to say we're doing, that's something that we are doing. Well, yeah, and no, I'm, I'm make... saying we're, we're, we're going to say it because it's important and we do believe it, but the bottom line, the reality is it's not an issue. It's not going to be picking up people's yards. It's not going to be picking up houses and, and looking into windows and capturing a license plate at the same time. One of the reasons that there are so many items that we're considering is to show the public and the board that this is a complicated issue and that we're giving it full attention and we're measuring the depth of how to best address these issues. Uh, letting you know that we're thinking things through. If you want, like I said, if you want to come on by one of these days and I can show you, you can see where it's, all you catch is a license plate and whatever kind of car it is and that's it. Anything else? Oh, I just had a question, yeah. Chief. Um, and maybe I, I was not understanding this. So now, 
who's going to be monitoring the, the feed on this? Will it be coming to Indian Head Park or to the vendor? Everything, all the information is ours. We are sole owners of, of all the license plates that are captured. Okay, so, so you, you had mentioned, like, say, a stolen vehicle came into right. the village, and they could get that information out right away. So who's going to be kind of monitoring the feed to see if that comes through? And well, the the, the vendor themselves send a message. The the company itself it's set up so when the car when the plate reads when the the camera reads it, it runs it. It comes up stolen. It sends a message. Right. Well, we'll have it configured already when the system is in place, and we'll then send a message to cell phones. The people on patrol, I'll get a message, Mike will get a message on our phones, and then we can work on seeing if we can find that vehicle. So nobody's going to sit at a desk and look at it, a, a, a oh, stolen vehicle, and then they're going to, like a dispatch center, that, that's not the way it works. It all works electronically, sends it automatically, the message out. And Chief, I think you put in your license plate for a period as kind of a trial. I did. And so then when you went through, people got an email or a text or some sort of communication. Yeah, that's correct. And I would go into the system, and when I looked at, for my plate, boom, it came up, and it, it, all, the, all the plates that are registered, picture of the plate, license plate number itself, it was all light gray. What my, my plate, when I put in the system, was highlighted a bright blue, so that way it, it stuck out that, hey, we got an alert here on this license plate. And I think we're, we're all familiar with like an amber alert. So explain if a car was stolen, how would that get into the system or an amber alert? That, well, that's all taken through the, the uh, Secretary of State's office. All these vendors have access to the Secretary of State's license plate files. So they're pumped in automatically uh, daily. They're put in daily, I ain't, maybe twice a day. I'm not sure, Mike, you know? Yeah, okay, once a day, and all this current information is dumped into the system, and these vendors pull it. But we also have the opportunity to put plates in ourselves of cars that we're looking for. We have crime alerts that go out community here in whole northern or western, southern Cook County. If there's a, for instance, Burr Ridge and a couple other towns are having issues with gypsies and burglars right now, where they're putting out flyers with uh, vehicle descriptions, license plates. So if we get one of those flyers, we can go into our system and put the license plate in, and that way, if a camera reads one of those license plates, boom, it'll, it'll ring up as well. It'll, it'll come up on us as well. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the vendor scoring and evaluation, <laughs> that's got nothing to do with me. Um, this is for the bids, and this will be John and, uh, I don't know, John, are you going to be doing that yourself, the scoring, or, or how does that work? Because I'm not uh, privy to how the scoring works. The committee will including you okay we'll sit down and we will go through the bids uh, thoughtfully um, and then we will present the bid tab to the board the committee will continue to review and make a recommend and the police committee will make a recommendation to the village board okay, so that will be how that will be taking place uh, the board or the committee I should say has worked up a sheet on our milestones and projected dates that we want to um, have certain things completed by, uh, as you can see, I'm, I'm not gonna read them for you, but bottom line is they want these cameras installed and working by next March 15th is what the, uh, the goal is for. They have these cameras implemented, functioning, and working by March 15th. Um, and an update as far as other camera vendors, uh, most of the vendors will not put out test cameras, excuse me, for, uh, for us because of the fact that it's not feasible for them to do that in regards to expense and things like that. So um, we have two companies, Vigilant, who's been out there for the last almost three weeks, and Flock we're working with currently. They should be putting out some cameras in the next day or two, or hopefully this week, uh, down by uh, on um, Wolf Road down here, just north of Joliet, and then there'll be two cameras capturing vehicles going both ways down there, and they'll put those out for a few weeks as well. But those are the only two vendors right now that are uh, willing to put out test cameras um, due to the facts. So, that, any other any questions? That is an issue, but it is important that our officers and the trustees can view things locally, and we can learn from the system when it's in place here, rather than just going to Hinsdale for three or four hours and looking at their system. I, I think we can make a far better judgment if the thing is if the this, the examples are local. So that's one of the issues we're facing. And, and I appreciate that, and I think that's fantastic. My, uh, so I have a couple of questions. 
starting with that, why would any vendor not want to do that? It, it would seem to... They're, due to the, because they don't want to put out the cost of putting those up and then not get the bid is what the, what it is. And um, the most of them are all like that. You know, it's to, for the village, they, they're they expected to pay for it. All the village isn't going to pay for anything in regards to that. And the cost is too high for them to put up poles, put up cameras, the manpower they do, and then if they don't get the bid, it, it's not worth it to okay. them. Chief, um, related question, uh, do, do you have to upload software to your computer for each of those separate vendors when they uh, no. put that in? No. Is it, is it common software then, uh, that's, like to, to view the screens? Well, I, don't, I wouldn't say common, but uh, for instance, Vigilant, he just they set up his camera, he came back in, and they see, he um, went to my computer and, and set me all up. It's all their, it's all on their, their, their software, their systems and things like that, and they basically just set us up. Thank you. Chief, sorry, I had two, two more quick questions. Um, you talked about reduction of what little crime we have. Do you have any statistics on when a village or a town per capita, what crime, how crime does diminish at all? Oh, no, I don't, I'm sorry, yeah. Okay. I'd be happy to look it up for you and, and give you an email or something. <laughs> um, in your opinion, any downsides to this? Any downside? Absolutely any not. In the area that have come up with, hey, this is a problem that we found that we didn't think of ahead of time, or no. The only the only downside is uh, it, it's not a hundred percent capture. I mean, it's high, but I mean, you can't do anything about that. Other than that, no. It's everything's an upside, and like I said, when we're trying to capture criminals, especially, now, and it's sad because nowadays when we, when we make arrests and we go to court. Gone are the days where a police officer's testimony and his police report is good enough for a, a conviction. Now it's not even going to pass the muster. And we need to have this extra ammo in regards to evidence. Picture a license plate, a person driving a kind of car to help solidify cases because the courts have just made it so difficult to get convictions on people that are truly guilty that we have them. But, and it just helps us out that much more. Uh, I want to remind everybody that the reason why we're doing this project is once a year the board sets goals and this was the number one goal to investigate the system. It doesn't mean that we have to do it, but it means to investigate, get the cost, understand what's involved like the policies, the attributes, all the things that were in the presentation. Um, and so that's why we're continuing to go forward and at some point the board will decide, does this make sense, right? And then we can go forward or not go forward, right? And lastly, uh, Steve, some of these systems, or I think all of them, are they all cloud-based? Uh, meaning that the software, like Charlie's question, um, you know, that wasn't something he put on your computer. It was a URL that you went to to see that data for the trial, I believe. Correct. Um, so it, it's not a like a server, we don't buy a server for any of these systems. Yeah. It's my it looks like John's turning his microphone on. <laughs> I just, yes, uh, we prefer cloud-based, but there is an option in the bid for a server, an internal server. Um, the research that we have to date indicates cloud-based is, is the way to go, but we're looking at all options and what's best for the village. So I'm still trying to understand Exactly. It, you, it captures the plate. It doesn't capture every plate. It captures maybe some of the car or all of the car. There's no video. And that's what all of these other villages have, that kind of a system. For the most part, yes. There's a couple. Every, I, I, the ones, I didn't get into um, stationary versus video. Yeah. But yes, all of them capture a picture of the license plate and whatever part of the car it does. Not all of them have any kind of vig uh, like vigilant and uh, flock and them do not. It's all snapshots. It's all a picture of the license plate and a picture of the car. That's it. There's no video. So you talk about going to court. You don't have a picture of the car, but you have the plate. You can prove John Doe was at a certain location at a certain time when the crime was committed. But that's right. yeah, we can prove that car go. was can't there. Tell who was in the car? Right. They can tell that car was there, and then we would it'd be our job to put that person in that car. That's correct. And uh, even though it's not capturing a good snapshot of the car itself, and every single picture we can determine at least what make the car is. Was it a Honda, was it a Toyota, was it a Chevy? That we can tell every single time, and the color. 
And Eileen, I would take up uh, the chief on his op, uh, offer. If you come in and look at it, I think five minutes will give you yeah. a pretty good idea of what That's all you, you need. get. Yeah. I'm curious about the powering these cameras. You, you said some have, they, they work on, do all of them work on solar or do only some of them? And you said some go make go as far as 15 days. I believe they're all solar uh, capabilities, but then again, you know, electricity is always the best way to go, but unfortunately for our town, we may not be able to in certain locations due to the trees, due to the running of the cables. You know, we, I don't believe we can tap into the ComEd pole because ComEd's not gonna sell us electricity. Um, so it's just gonna, and the solar power, as I said, various vendors were, their solar, their bat backup batteries lasted anywhere from three days to 15 days. It just depended who was. So, who's yeah, doing what? so I'm just curious, is that ever a problem and how do we decide what we're gonna go with and if we do need to have backup electricity for these, do how do we do that? Do we get it from residents or do we? <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I've heard that the, some towns do use residents as they do allow them to tap in because it's so, the, it's so minuscule, the, the prices. So we can certainly address that uh, when we're looking at the packages. When we get into the weeds of camera placement, that's is an anticipated discussion item. Yeah, it just seems like the kind of thing that could be very costly. Um, and you know, I wouldn't worry about like backup power. electricity because like I say, it's just how long is that solar gonna last in these gloomy days and how many sunny days, winter days do we have versus non. And any non-functioning, any issues with operation, all of the companies that we've dealt with so far have promised they're either out this, that day or they're gonna be out real quick the next day to, to get it taken care of. And for it to truly be an issue, everything would have to go down at the same time. If you have one camera right. at a corner that's out, but the car proceeds through three more intersections. It's a good it's chance gonna we're going to catch them anyways, correct. Right. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you, you Chief. Okay, next item up is the property tax extension levy resolution 06-2021. John, is this you? Oh. Yes, somebody like to make a motion. Sure, I'll make a motion to pass resolution uh, 06-2021, a resolution determining the estimated property tax to be levied by the village for the tax year 2021. I'll second. Thank you, Chris and Sean. Now, John, and All right, thank so you, So you have Pat. before you the resolution that will establish the, the tax amount to be levied next year. And then in December, we'll actually have the ordinance levying the, the tax for the year. The Village of Indian Head Park is a non-home rule community. So therefore we are affected by the tax caps for a large number of our taxable areas. Uh, this year's uh, tax cap is set at 1.4% uh, increase over last year's levy. Um, and we actually won't know what the full numbers are going to be based on our levy until June of next year. So we are making an educated guess as to what the actual levy will be for next year. So you have before you, um, we're looking at $1,278,513 uh, $1, uh, as our levy. And that will be distributed among the several funds within the village, including our debt service requirements. So you have a worksheet, so you have a method to the madness uh, of preparing the levy. And I do this once a year, and every year I have to go back to the tax code uh, of Illinois to look at how we do the levy, because I, I do it once a year and it, it can be confusing. So I have a worksheet, uh, I call it a cheat sheet, that's in your board packet to kind of walk you through how I came to, to the numbers. So. At the end of the day, we're looking at about a $3,300 increase in our, in our property tax levy from the prior year. It will probably be a little bit more because the county will add a certain percentage on top of that to cover anybody who doesn't pay their property taxes. So even though we're gonna levy $1.278 million, we're probably gonna end up collecting about $1.3 million in next year's levy. Uh, just because of how the county adds stuff to, adds amounts to our, our base levy. So all in all, uh, the increase is uh, minimal on a per household basis. Now we have about 2,200 properties in the village. 
So I think I told you that all in all, the levy is just a few dollars per household. Um, and that's for every property in the village average out. Most people will see an increase of about $4 a year. A dollar fifty two per parcel. Okay, thank you. Uh, and that's for every parcel in the village. So, and that's your portion of the Indian Head Park portion of the tax bill. So, as I said, we are impacted by uh, the cost of living, and the state of Illinois Department of Revenue publishes their um, the CPI rate for the for the state for the year for those areas impacted by the tax caps. And this year it's a 1.4% increase. So that's what we can raise our, our property tax levy for the year. So um, I would request that you pass uh, the resolution. Um, and if you have any questions, please. John, for anybody's real estate tax bill, that portion, which is Indian Head Park, I believe is less than 10%. It's about 10%, yes. Yeah. Okay, so this adds. Um, a majority of your tax bill goes to the school district. And I think everybody knows that. Any other questions for John? Any other questions or comments? Okay, can we have a roll call vote, please, Clerk Allison? Yes, let's start with uh, Trustee Mitz. Aye. Okay. Uh, Trustee Kennedy. Aye. Trustee Farrell Mayer. Aye. Okay, Trustee Eck. Aye. Trustee Donnersburg. Aye. Thank you. And well, Trustee O'Loughlin is absent. All right, that has been approved. Yes. On to the next item. Uh, Rita, do you want to make a motion? Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to pass Ordinance 2021 15, an ordinance granting a special use for a shed at 1614 65th Place. I oh, think I um, the order, I think you have the next one if we need to follow the order, I think. Oh. I think it's 2021-14. Let me see. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. You're correct. Uh, it's 2021-14. I make a motion to pass ordinance 2021-14. An ordinance granting a special use for a shed at 1624 65th place. I'll second that motion. All right, thank you, Rita and Charlie. Excuse me. <laughs> Is this uh, Andy or John or? I'm gonna set up. Um, the next three ordinances are very similar. Uh, we're granting a special use or and or a variance for sheds. All of this started about 18 months ago when the Shed and Fence Committee started looking at amending our rules in, in the village for whether or not sheds or, or fences would be allowed and under what circumstances. The committee gave their results to the village board and in June of this year, the board passed a shed ordinance um, stipulating what conditions could a special use for a shed be granted. And some of the conditions are, it's um, not a mere convenience for the property owner. Um, the shed has to be surrounded on three sides by uh, natural plantings to provide screening from, from the street or adjacent lots. Um, the shed has to be in the buildable area, except if a variance is granted. The shed has to be a true shed in, in that there's no water to it or electricity, uh, no animals. Um, it truly is an external structure for the storage of, of items. And we did stipulate or give a parameter for the size of the, of the shed. And we need to, and one of the reasons for a special use is you have to consider the need of the property owner, mm -hmm. the, the neighborhood that it's in, the conditions of the house. So does the house have a basement or is it built on a slab? Is there a one car garage or a two car garage? Do they have any other external structures? All of these are things that you consider when having a special use or granting a variance. So all of this, this process went through and we're starting on the Bartlett subdivision, which is on the far east side of the village. And then we're gonna expand the shed study, so to speak, 
to the rest of the village after the Robert Bartlett subdivision is done. We have most of the issues with sheds in that subdivision, so we thought we would start there first. Uh, that is kind of the history of what we are doing, so we're just continuing on the work that the Shed and Fence Committee and ultimately the board uh, did in June of this year. And also I would add that uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission considered all three of these last week and had an extended hearing on each of them. And in addition to what John had said, they also required that any screening that needs to be done on the sheds has to be done by July 1st of this year. And that if the, vill the village will follow up to ensure that uh, that screening is in fact done and done to the satisfaction of the ordinance. So I just wanted to add that as well. Thank you. So we have, Andy, how many cases will we have ultimately? So in the uh, Bartlett subdivision, we will have 19. It, it will be more after that, but in the but Bartlett. All of these will be considered individually and everyone is treated as its own case. So we're starting off with three just to kind of get eased with the process and then we will be having more in December, January and February. And there was one at Planning and Zoning, right, that didn't get approved that they went back. They have to get more information, right? Correct. So this process, as I understand it, Planning and Zoning will review a few each period, and then the ones that are approved by Planning and Zoning come to the board. And this also goes back to the special committee that Chairman, I mean, that uh, Trustee Kennedy chaired uh, last year to consider allowing for this procedure for the sheds that existed in the Bartlett subdivision and fences. Okay, so that's uh, kind of the overview. Uh, any questions about that? And then I think we can get into the specifics and hopefully we don't need to do the overview every time. Uh, and I think once we do one or two, we'll get, you know, much like planning and zoning did, kind of get the flow. And then Andy can take specifics. Okay, so Andy, are you going to tell us about 2021-14? 1624 65th place yeah so this this uh is for the property property owner's name is gerald matthews and uh in their case they've had this shed for 42 years uh and in this case also um as you can see in the photos in the uh supplemental packet that's with you also yep thank you david pull it up right there it already has screening uh, and so for this one, it was one of the easier ones. The commission unanimously recommended uh, approval with the only condition being the payment of the bulk mailing fee, which was the fee that was evenly divided amongst all of the homeowners of the Bartlett subdivision uh, for zoning uh, hearing notices that were sent out. And so again, it was a unan unanimous recommendation. Uh, the condition of screening was not required as it already is uh, blocked from view. So and that's pretty much it for this one. <laughs> and the pictures that David put up on the screen and that you have in the board packet, uh, the, the intent is for planning and zoning to get that for every um, shed and fence going forward. And then of course the board would get that same information. Yes, and I would also um, mention just really quickly that um, a stipulation for all of these is that their neighbors, uh, adjacent homeowners, have to sign off. Um, and so for all of the applications we've received, the adjacent homeowners have uh, signed saying that they don't object to the placement of the shed. Charlie, did you have something you wanted to add? Look like you were. I'm fine, thank you. All right, any other questions, comments? Okay, um, Clerk Allison, could we have a roll call vote on this first 2021-14 and the address is 1624 65th place. All right, uh, Trustee Farrell Mayer. Aye. And Trustee Eck. Aye. And Trustee Donnersburg. Aye. Uh, Trustee Kennedy. Aye. And Trustee Metz. Aye. Thank you, that has been approved. All right, that is approved, and uh, congratulations, Gerald. Um, Rita, do you want to make a motion for the next one? Sure, I make a motion to pass Ordinance 2021-15, an ordinance granting a special use for a shed at 1614 65th place. 
And I'll second that motion as well. Thank you, Rita and Charlie. Andy? So this one's very similar, uh, neighbors of the previous one. And uh, this shed was also um, kind of an easier one. It, it was already screened on both sides from the adjacent homeowners. Uh, the adjacent homeowners signed off uh, that they do not object to the, uh, to the placement. And the um, Planning and Zoning Commission recommended uh, unanimously approval of it, uh, again, with the stipulation that the bulk mailing fee be paid. Uh, and again, this one's already screened, so uh, the screening inspection won't be uh, required uh, by July 1st. So. Questions or comments? Okay, Clerk Allison, could we have a roll call vote, please? I, okay, let me stop here a moment. I need to know who. Um, Rita and Charlie. Rita, this was Rita and Charlie? Yep. Okay, thank and they you. may I, do the I'm next sorry one I too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, so let's go again with uh, Trustee Farrell Mayor. Aye. And Trustee Eck. Aye. And Trustee Kennedy. Aye. And Trustee Metz. Aye. And Trustee Donnersberger. Aye. Again. Okay. And uh, Trustee O'Loughlin is absent. All right. Thank so you. That approved. has been approved. Thank you. Okay. I make a motion to pass Ordinance 2021 16, an ordinance granting a special use and variance for a shed at 1704 65th place. And I'll second that. Thank you, Rita and Charlie. Andy? Yes, yeah, so this one uh, is just slightly different. Um, this one is uh, a shed that has existed for a while, uh, but it is currently in the non, not in the buildable area. Although when the shed ordinance was passed by the, by the um, Board of Trustees, one of the amendments that was added to it was that uh, great uh, consideration be given to uh, property owners with sheds that currently exist in the not buildable area as long as uh, the adjacent homeowners have given their signatures stating that they don't object to the placement. Uh, and again, we do have the adjacent homeowners' signatures uh, and the commission uh, unanimously recommended approval of both the special use for the shed and the variance to allow it to remain where it is outside of the special area or outside of the buildable area. And um, this, this is also the first case in which a screening inspection it will be required. Uh, that was another one of the conditions uh, recommended by the commission. And so the plan is to have, everyone's gonna know that they have to have the plannings in by July 1st, and that is when the village will start to do uh, the follow-up inspections. Andy, on the uh, screening in this case, um, we know that plants take a while to grow, so it will not be required to be, what, 75% covered? Can you address that? Yeah, you know, on, yeah, since it takes time to grow, when we do finally, uh, in July 1st, when we do go out to do these inspections, some of them, if the plantings are not fully grown yet, uh, we might need to schedule another follow-up, um, but we'll, we will make sure that all of them are compliant uh, eventually. Any questions, comments? I'm gonna take a moment and uh, thank Lou. Lou is here. Um, Lou um, kind of took on the duties of uh, leader over there or mayor in that area or mayor of the whole village. Uh, but Lou <laughs> took the brunt work of going around to talk to everybody 18 months ago and Lou became a, a central point in that neighborhood. Uh, so I know it was a lot of work, Lou, and I thank you for doing that. And I know the work is not done because everybody else who's in line is going to come to you and ask questions and all that. But thank you very much, Lou, for all the work that you put in. Okay, any questions, comments? Okay, Clerk Allison, okay. could we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Trustee Farrell, Mayor. Aye. And Trustee Eck. Aye. Trustee Metz. Aye. Trustee Kennedy. Aye. And Trustee Donnersberger. Aye. Okay, thank you. And once again, Trustee O'Loughlin is absent. All right, that has been approved. Uh, would somebody like to make a motion for the next ordinance, 2021-17, removing gaming license at Driftwood? 
I'll make a motion to pass ordinance 2021-17, an ordinance removing the gaming license at Driftwood, for Driftwood. <coughs> Dash Driftwood, yeah, whatever. And a second? I'll second. Thank you, Sean and Rita. John? Uh, the village regulates um, gaming establishments. Uh, the board had previously granted a uh, gaming license to Ron Vary, uh, who is the manager or owner of, of Driftwood. Uh, Ron is not renew Ron is in the process of selling uh, his business and therefore um, will not be needing a, a gaming license. Um, as an aside, uh, the landlord has agreements of Indian Head Plaza has agreements with some tenants and basically there's a non-compete clause for gaming uh, facilities in, uh, in the plaza. So Driftwood has not been using their gaming license um, over the last six months. So basically this is a ministerial removal of the of an available license. Thank you, John. Any questions or comments? I don't hear any. Uh, Clerk Allison, a roll call vote, please. Trustee Kennedy. Aye. And Trustee Farrell Mayer. Aye. Trustee Eck. Aye. Trustee Donnersberger. Aye. And um, Trustee Metz. Aye. And Trustee O'Loughlin but again is counted absent. That has been approved. Thank you, everybody. Would somebody like to make the uh, next ordinance, 2021-18? to pass ordinance 2021-18 an ordinance granting a liquor license to SOG protection doing business as the Driftwood Lounge. I'll second. Thank you Eileen and Sean. John? Um, again the village regulates how many liquor licenses are in the village. And right now you have one class A liquor license available. Driftwood is in the process of being sold to a new owner. We're basically transferring the license from the old owner to the new owner who happens to be a resident of the village. Um, I emailed you privately his, his home address earlier. I don't necessarily want that uh, in the public, but he is a resident of the village as his, is his bar manager. They're both residents of the village and they live in Old Town. Um, so it's an ordinance. Uh, granting a liquor license, uh, new ownership. Uh, I've already reached out to uh, Mr. Gaynor, who is here tonight, I believe, and he will be talking or asking, answering questions if you have any. But some of the concerns that we had with the operations of Driftwood will be going away. Um, I've already let um, Mr. Gaynor know, no outdoor drinking without specific village board approval. Um, and so we're looking forward to working with a new owner. I have a question. Um, being new to the board, is there a process that uh, applicant for liquor license needs to go through, like background checks and all Correct. that? Correct. Okay. Um, there is an application that is submitted. I turn it over to the chief of police. The principals come in and are, and are fingerprinted, and we do a background check on them. So I do want to ask uh, if you could come up to the microphone, please. Uh, do you intend any changes to Driftwood? Anything of any, would there be any? possibility of a kitchen being added in the future what uh what no we're not we're right now it's just going to be more or less cosmetic and sanitation just clean it up fresh coat of paint and conduct business as it's being conducted today when you say conduct business as it's being conducted today are you still planning on a relationship with capri next door paper? um at this time i don't believe they have any type of formal it's just uh, uh it was a verbal agreement, and I think that's been canceled okay. many, many months ago. Are people Co allowed to bring food in? Or? People, yeah, they will be allowed to bring food in. A couple of questions uh, in regards. The applicant's name is uh, RDSGA LLC. Uh, how long has that uh, LLC been active? Uh, that's from the previous owner, and we'll be establishing a new LLC for it. What's SOG? Uh, Protection. LLC. That is my individual LLC company. And how long has that been? Uh, um, I've been an LLC for approximately three years. Is there any other entities in that uh, LLC? Uh, no. So this will be the single. Uh, oh no, we're going to have we're going to have um, my business partner also has 
an LLC business that we're going to be uh, partners with 5050. What's that name? That we're going to be equal ownership in the uh, in the driftwood itself. I'm sorry, I wasn't clear on the response. Nick, do you want to come up? Yeah, I think <laughs> Jim, you couldn't see Nick. He was raining his hand. Don't go too far, Jim. Yeah. Uh, Nick Dubak. Hi. Uh, so, yeah, we have a uh, Driftwood Partners IHP LLC will be the holding company of the RDG LLC. We'll be assuming all membership interests of that entity. So, for all intensive purposes, we are purchasing all membership interests. Through the uh, Driftwood Partnership is acquiring? Correct. So SOG Protection and IMX Group LLC are the uh, two members of the IHP, of the uh, Driftwood Partners LLC IHP. Okay. And we're looking at 100% of the ownership uh, between you and the gentleman behind That is you. correct. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? When will you... Uh, Type O blood if you need to know. <laughs> uh, when will this uh, go through? When will the... Uh, well, it's completely contingent upon the approvals here. Oh, okay. And uh, <clears throat> we were a little bit blindsided by this revocation, actually, to be quite honest with you, of, of gaming. Um, but uh, we can discuss that on a separate matter. Uh, well, so I appreciate uh, Nick and Jim, you guys coming, uh, as long as you are at the podium. Uh, and I, again, appreciate sure. you answering our questions. Do you want to... Um, make a plug for the new uh, driftwood. Uh, you know, we're, we're uh, there'll be in there'll be a new staff. There'll be some new faces. Um, hopefully, some uh, service with a smile. Um, we are looking forward to establishing some new food relationships. We're also looking forward to rekindling whatever's there with uh, whatever's not there really with Capri. I think they have a, a great service, and we can streamline things a little bit better. And and. Uh, you know, we think it's more of a burden for people to bring food in from the outside. While we're at this point, we don't plan on prohibiting it. We plan on giving people a conduit by which they can have food and drinks and, and feel like it's all part of the same establishment. We'll do some new theme nights as well. Um, you know, f up, up for further discussion with village officials, but we'd love to see if we could even bring in some themed food truck nights and stuff like that for our patrons. Um, you know, so we've got some ideas. Uh, those all have to be shaken out. We're just looking forward to getting in there, um, you know, dusting it off and, and really getting a deep clean and, and some new, uh, some new uh, cosmetics to the facility, if you will. So and new blood and new leadership. Right? New blood, some new leadership. You know, I, I, don't, I have a full-time job. Jim has uh, obviously been in law enforcement pre previously and recently retired, so we're going to give him something to do. All right, any other questions or comments from the board? Yeah, I've, I've got one. When, uh, if I remember right, when Driftwood was uh, first established and uh, we, they, Ron Vary came up here, he, I think he talked about um, the dry cleaners in between Capri and Driftwood being gone within a year or two. The owners wanted to retire, and then that was probably going to become a kitchen. Is there any, any is, was that just a, I'm completely unaware that? of that, Jim. I don't know if no, you have any. No idea. We have no idea. I mean, we're we obviously, obviously we're if there's a business reason to do it, we're completely open to it. But um, we're very much in the in the early stages of this journey, and we're looking forward just to to fixing what we have right now within those four walls. Okay. And we're not opposed to reinvesting. We have the means to do so for the right reasons. Any others? Well, again, thank you both okay, for uh, coming in tonight. Um, do I have any other questions, comments from the board? I don't see or hear. Uh, Clerk Allison, can we have a roll call vote, please? A trustee Donnersberger. Aye. A trustee Kennedy. Aye. A trustee Eck. Type O votes no. <laughs> okay. A uh, Farrell Mayor, Dr. Uh, trustee Farrell Mayor, please. Aye. Okay, and Trustee Metz. Aye. Okay, and uh, once again, Trustee O'Loughlin is counted as absent tonight. Thank All right, you. that motion is approved. Congratulations, gentlemen. All right, next item up.
I make a motion to pass ordinance 2021-19 an ordinance establishing a COVID-19 vaccination policy for the village. I second it. Um, hang on one second. Yeah, I have development on my sheet, but I don't know if this. It's not on the motion index because there's no vote required. Yeah. But on the agenda, I have development like before that. The, before the ordinance. Right. Mm -hmm. um, if you guys will hold on to that, we're going to do the. We just went out of order. Right unless there's a reason to go out of order, right? But if you're okay, stick to the order. Okay, so uh, this is a first development for 6921 Joliet Road, a first look. And John, could you explain why it's a first look? Um, the, P, the planning unit development ordinance um, has a stipulation where a potential developer comes in and presents the idea to the village board just to see if there's any traction for the idea because going through the review process can be costly for Looks the petitioner. Nice. Um, and takes a lot of staff time and we want to make sure that any potential development okay. meets our our vision for the triangle so that's why uh, the petitioner is here um, Nick Reviolis is a resident of the village his architect um, Kirk Alexikos I hope I pronounced your name correct and uh, he is going to be talking about what he sees as a, the vision for the dome property Welcome, Kirk. Hi, how are you? All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the Board of Trustees, and happy Veterans Day, Day to everyone. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for allowing us to appear before you tonight. I would also like to thank Mr. John DeRocher and Andy, Mr. Andy Farini for all their assistance in helping us get to this point. My name is Kirk Alexagos, Principal Architect of Epic ACD. I am appearing before you tonight with Mr. with the property owners, Mr. Dimitris Catris and Tas Mr. Tasos Catris. Uh, Mr. Nick Revellotis is currently out of the country, but he does send his appreciation as well. Their families have owned parcel one of the Triangle Area Redevelopment at the southwest corner of Joliet Road and Wolf Road for almost 10 years. The existing vacant property previously had on it the old Dome Family Restaurant. The owners have shown interest in and are intending to develop the vacant 15,000 square foot property that has been sitting vacant since 2016. As you can see in the packet we provided you, they are proposing a new 3,200 square foot commercial shopping center with three tenant spaces of approximately 1,000 square feet each. The proposed building has been laid out on the site to take advantage of and make the best of the acute corner property. It has been designed with a potential drive-through lane, which can entice more major anchor tenants to the area. It consists of 13 total parking spaces in the new landscape parking lot that take vehicular access into account, as well as minimizing pedestrian vehicular conflict by placing the spaces closer to the building, rather than forcing pedestrians to cross multiple driving lanes in order to access the units. The proposed building has been designed with a brick masonry veneer and fiber cement cladding system above of alternating warm and modern colors along with an aluminum awning system over the windows and doors to allow for protection from the weather as well as a more modern and current design element. The colors chosen have been selected to provide the building with a cohesive color scheme and act as an attractive backdrop to retail tenant signage. The shopping center's proposed design would modernize the visible facades and op update the streetscape of the shopping center to be in line with newer and aesthetically contemporary designs found in recently built retail centers. The varying parapet heights and overall building curb appeal have been designed to allow for interplay of differing volumes, separating the tenant units visually in a way that they can each have different levels of exposure and attention from both Joliet and Wolf Roads. We hope you agree that the proposed development is respectful of the visual feel of Indian Head Park, while also lifting the bar on the appearance of retail de developments in and around the area. We feel as if we found a balance between providing respectful design that would draw in tenants and customers alike, while satisfying the modern touches the shopping center needs as a prominent piece of the Indian Head Park community. We appreciate your time and consideration of your submit for our submittal. Thank you. Thank you. If you don't mind, we may have some questions. Absolutely. Uh, 
Sean? Yes. Do we have any tenants in mind already? Uh, there have been discussions, but for the time being, there are no concrete um, tenants right now. Anyone Would there else? be a drive-through component to it? It's on, on the table. I've designed it to allow for it, but again, it's not even known if it's necessary right now. I'm giving them the flexibility to do it. I've got a little concern about the parking spaces. Sure. It's just room for 13. Sure. And if you've got three units and you've got maybe two cars for each unit for just employees, it doesn't leave much for any customers. So is there any agreement with the Indian Head Plaza? or? Um, the site is already uh, on the smaller side. Finding enough parking spaces is difficult. Um, we are hoping that the uses are going to be transient uses where the cars will not be staying for a very long time. Um, and in terms of discussions with uh, neighbors, uh, they're, according to the owners, they have started the conversations. They are not as receptive. So maybe those con conversations have to continue. Do we have any typical requirements for parking? Or? Our building code does require uh, par have parking requirements. But again, this is a planned unit development, so the board is granted flexibility if they so choose. Right, but what would if it wasn't a planned unit development, what would the parking requirements be? I don't know that off the top of my head. I do know that it is specified in our code of ordinances. I, if I may add, I did do a brief uh, calculation, <laughs> and I think it was per square footage, um, and each unit, as you mentioned, was around one to two to three cars each unit, as is. So depending on what use, if you're gonna use an office use or uh, dental offices or a Dunkin' Donuts, for example, those are all different. So as the architect, I know that you um, may not, you obviously don't know the answer to it, and it's that, but would you convey to the owner that um, this is a planned unit development and we're looking for certain kinds of uh, businesses up there. Mm -hmm. And right now there's an awful lot of little, uh, you know, thousand foot stores. I don't know if we need any more, um, but it would depend upon what would go in there. So I'd like to know more about what his plans are. Absolutely. And again, I wanna remind um, the board of the process we're going through. This is the first look and so this idea is being presented and thank you again for coming to do that. And um, you and the owner are looking for feedback because uh, then, you know, assuming everybody says yes or if everybody said no, that would be feedback. But if we said yes, then that would go, they could go then to the next step to the planning and zoning and go through the process. And then this would come back at some point. But again, initially looking for feedback uh, you know, what you like about the building, what you don't like, you know, questions like the parking, things like that. Just to remind everybody. I'll share some, uh, I think, from what I've seen on the mic. Is your mic on? Yeah. yeah. Hello? Is it working? Mike? Mike? Um, I, I like the way it looks. I, with what Trustee Donnersberg just said, I'm concerned with, with multiple small shops. Um, is it maybe a better location for, for one unit um, that would also probably help with the parking issue then because they would have all the parking accessible. Um, I would also like to get a better idea if they and when they get to the point of what will go in there. Um, I don't know that we need to take any business away from what's already there sure. would be one concern or to just duplicate something that's already there. Um, so I, I, I definitely would be interested to see what eventually would go in sure. to that building. Sure. I would concur with uh, Trustee Metz and Trustee Donnersberger and Trustee Kennedy and, and seeing what, what is going to be brought before us that would be in the building. And I do think the PUD would be better served by a single tenant. A single tenant, sure. Yeah, I also... Uh, uh, like the idea of retail in there, I think you got an issue with parking. And as uh, Trustee Donnersberger and uh, Kennedy said, that uh, you might be trying to pack in too much uh, into a small area. I did do some quick um, design variations, and even uh, eliminating 
a thousand square feet of building and just making a two thousand square foot building, which isn't very large for you know a single tenant, um, you only gain one to two parking spaces. So uh, the parking limitation is noticeable on the property for what it's worth. <laughs> I, I want to make sure. I want to make sure um, that you are aware, and I think you have a, have had a discussion with John. It came up earlier about Wolf Road sure. uh, in Joliet. So that is uh, in phase one with the county. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is some potential because of the proximity to that intersection that the Joliet Road uh, driveway would be right on, right in, right out. Correct. Uh, so that's a potential. And then the Wolf Road uh, driveway may be ex uh, potential to lose that again because it's so close to that intersection. We did briefly discuss it with John, and okay. we are aware of Just it. Just want to yes. make sure. I appreciate that. And, and I like the uh, look of the building. I think it looks good. Thank you. Um, so I think he did a good job on the design. Uh, it was contemporary. I really appreciate you saying that. All right, any other, uh, John, I have a question about, you know, we've asked about the kind of business going in. Um, my understanding is right now, as uh, we've heard, that this is being built spec, you know, to get tenants later. That's my understanding. So if they build the building without any tenants, right, and then uh, a month later they now have company XYZ that wants to come in, what's the process as long as it's in approved uh, business do we correct the underlying zoning is b3 which is uh, commercial so the entire plaza is b3 so um, retail shops such as a, a, a food store or a um, a restaurant or a cleaners or a uh, an ombudsman service could go in there all of which we already have correct. but i'm gi giving those as so examples. i'm a south sider I'm from Beverly. How about a rainbow ice cream cone store? There? <laughs> I will put that down. Yeah. <laughs> but I think what I wanted to raise is that the building can be built as a spec building, and then we may not have control over what goes in as long as it's Correct. under our permitted Correct. uses. So we may want a bubblegum store or whatever. I made that up. Uh, but we may not be able to get that if we allow this to be built as a spec without tenants. Just wanted to be clear. Other questions or comments? Do you have any questions for us? I know that you did a nice presentation and I think you've gotten some feedback, but anything specific? You've definitely given me enough feedback that I could relay over to the owner and I feel like the conversation um, is probably best suited with more questions at a later time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, uh, Sean, I believe you had the next motion. Again, <coughs> sorry That's okay. for our confusion. Uh, I will, again, make a motion to pass Ordinance 2021-19, an ordinance establishing COVID-19 vaccination policy for the village. And again, I second it. Thank you, Sean and Eileen. John, is this you to... Uh, give an overview yes. for this um, you have an ordinance before you that would require mandatory vac vaccinations for all village employees and contractors doing business with the village uh, of note um, since this is a matter of conditions and terms and conditions of employment um, with whatever collective bargaining agreements we have in place this has to be negotiated with that collective bargaining unit so they would be exempt from the ordinance until such time as that can be negotiated into the contract. Um, the ordinance is, is self-explanatory, and if you have any questions of me, you can, uh, you can please ask or ask our village attorney. Uh, Charlie? You want to indicate what you uh, were putting as the effective date on that, John? The effective date is June 30th of 2022. Um, that is uh, my consideration for inserting that date is there's a lot going on with regards to the state and mandatory vaccinations and this way is winding it through uh, several other municipalities and it could be a matter of arbitration for those municipalities. I thought extending it could give us a little bit more leeway and information available 
further on down the road, but the board can implement the effective date as they so wish. I have a couple questions. So who are the employees covered by collective bargaining agreement? agreement. Right now it's a full-time police officers. That is, that is it? Officers. That's it. Th that is the only collective bargaining agreement we have in place right now. Uh, and how many of those do we have? Uh, we have seven officers covered under the collective bargaining agreement who are full-time officers. And have we had any feedback from any residents about this proposed ordinance? Yes. Um, at the coffee with the mayor, we had several residents comment favorably upon having a mandatory vaccination ordinance. And then we've had feedback tonight from residents who feel otherwise. How many part, refresh my memory, how many part-time officers? We have 15 part-time police officers right now. And as a public um, announcement, uh, we have been served that they are seeking uh, recognition of a part-time police officers union. And that is public information. But again, what we're talking about tonight does not cover them, is that correct? correct? John, clarify, it does not cover them? Not because we do not have a collective bargaining agreement with them and our labor attorney has said it's status quo. So I took that to be, uh, they, they would be covered under the ordinance, ordinance if I am advised otherwise by our labor attorney, I will let you know. So clearly those are not contractors. Correct. It, you said Contractor would be the village engineer, our building inspector. Well, I think Sean's question is they would be covered just not as a collective bargaining unit Correct. today. So this as presented covers the entire village yes, staff, okay. but the police union, the full-time staff today, because that's what we have, right. um, would be bargained with. We have to Did I get all that, that right, John? So the June 2022 date, is that something that you, um, I mean, educated guests pulled arbitrarily or you expect certain things to be done by then? I'm just wondering why. I, I think that I, I pulled that date based on some new state laws that, that were, have been passed that give municipalities more um, authority for implementing policies of this type. Um, the new policy by the state of Illinois comes into effect June 1st. I thought it was June 30th. Um, it'll also give us a chance to watch what other municipalities have. And I know that this is going to arbitration in other municipalities so that we could watch what happens with them. I also want to point out that the city of Countryside passed a very similar ordinance about a month ago. And they, they're proceeding with, and they've had no issues that I know of. So can I ask um, our council a question? Are we different? as a municipality from businesses such as United? We are as a government, yes. So the courts would treat us differently? Well, I'd, that's a different question. Okay. <laughs> well, I know we're different. I mean, it's yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, there's different gov authority that a governmental unit has that private corporations such as United do not have and is Trust, as uh, Village Administrator DeRocher said, there's been also changes in state law that pertain to municipalities. As So we are treated under a separate set of guidelines than a private corporation as well. Uh, but to kind of go on to your question, um, there has been an, an, is a mandate that municipalities over 100 have to implement 100 employees have to implement this policy. We are clearly under okay. the 100 threshold. Okay, I, I just want to say that I do believe the science and I do believe uh, in the uh, vaccine and it's not unusual that vaccines are required. I mean, kids can't go to school without them. Mm -hmm. um, employers can require them. Um, in the past. Um, I'm not sure why this vaccine is being treated differently. Um, I know that the, uh, I, I feel that this is never going to go away if, unless we do have, um, we do have vaccinations. Um, I don't think this is taking anybody's freedom away. It, no, it's not, nobody's being forced to have a vaccine. Um, if they want to work here, if we pass this ordinance, 
obviously uh, they would they would have to have the vaccine, but they would don't have to necessarily work here if they feel that strongly about it. Uh, um, so that that's where I'm on, the, on this. I've got you know family members that are immunocompromised, and I'm concerned about them. I I wish everybody was vaccinated for their sake. Um, I have another family member that works with people that uh, are vulnerable, and so I feel very strongly that the vaccines um, can be mandated. Uh, and for our, for our village employees, if they want to work here, I have to agree with Chris um, wholeheartedly. And uh, as you said, Chris, there are any number of vaccines that are mandated by schools. Your child cannot go to school unless you have measles, rubella, and all the rest of the polio. I remember when I was a kid, we lined up to get the polio shot. Um, and it's there to protect us. And I, again, I agree with you. I believe in the science very strongly. All right, so I Any other comments? I think Rita summarized it very nicely. Thank you. Uh, I know that, John, um, you have presented a June 30th date. I think there was also the state date of June 1. Uh, and then, of course, I think the board could make any date. Um, I just want to see if there's any thought about date. You know, keep it as is or another date. Yeah. From my perspective, June 30th gives us a lot of flexibility uh, going forward. Agreed. And, and I would prefer to see a date of like January 31st. I'm just not sure why we would be waiting. Well, yeah, I, I agree with you, Chris, but again, to John's point, let's see where uh, the ball kind of goes and we can follow suit with that. Um, John said there's going to be some um, collective bargaining. I, I don't know how long that would take. It should, in my mind, not take to June 30th, but I could see it surpassing January 31st easily. So, you know, the sooner the better for me. I agree with everybody else on the board. I live with a healthcare professional that was vaccinated in January of last year. She works for the government. It was basically mandated to her, and she just got her third shot yesterday. Everybody in my family, including all three children, are vaccinated. I am totally 100% behind the science. I don't have any issues with it whatsoever. Um, and as Chris said, I think it's our best way out of this. I don't think anybody in this room wants to be wearing these masks, yeah. yet everybody yeah. is. That's a mandate. We seem to be following that. Don't understand why we draw the line between certain mandates and not, and again, in my opinion, from the science that I've been told by my wife, this is how we get out of it. So that's where I'm coming from. So is there a compromise date we can put? Um, because it, it should dip, although it's going up now, again, from what I heard on the news right before I came here. Um, but it should dip during the winter, right? Isn't that what happened? No? No, it actually will go up because more oh, close. Oh, you're inside. Inside and closer, yes. Yeah, so. So, so just for your information, so if you passed it as is tonight with the June 30th effective date, you, there's always the opportunity to bring it back before you on another agenda. If, if circumstances warranted, you could al always amend that ordinance um, and, and advance the date if, if circumstances required or extend the date if circumstances required. Or likewise, we could make it the January 31st and extend it. That's a possibility. But the motion was uh, as the 30th, uh, right, Pat? So that's correct. So it, it would be amended or so the motion maker would have to make that amended motion and then if they want a change date. Correct. As, as, it's, on the, as it's on the table now is for the June 30th as set forth in the packet. Am I the only one thinking about the 31st of January? Well, no, I mean, I, I, again, I agreed with you, the sooner the better for me, but I just don't know if that's enough time realistically for what needs to happen to happen. I, I would look for some input from Pat or John as to, 
the collective bargaining should only take two weeks, okay, then a January 31st is a possibility. The collective bargaining only, bargaining only affects seven of the employees. I, I understand that, but it's still part of the entire ordinance. The last time we, we entered into, we renegotiated the existing union contract, we are a year and a half. And, and that was just a renewal of, of a contract. So we went way beyond the, the uh, ex expiration date. John, hypothetically, if the board did make it January 31st and it was approved um, and the negotiation with the collective bargaining didn't happen before then, then would they kind of continue as they were and then the rest of the staff would be under the new? Correct, correct. So then the negotiations with the collective bargaining unit would take as long as they take and then depending on how that went, it would either be approved then or not approved or whatever came out of that discussion. And if we could not come to an agreement with the collective bargaining unit, then we would go to arbitration. And there's a process spelled out in the contract for that. Pat, you ready? Do you have something to say? I, I did. I just want to make sure the board is clear. So the way there's an ordinance that adopts the policy, right? So the ordinance that is adopting the policy states that it shall be in full force and effect on June 30th, 2022. The policy that is attached to it requires full vaccination by that date, by that June 30th, 2020 date. So that's what's before you is that it would be in effect and required as of that date. And that's your intent, right, John? That was my intent when I presented the ordinance. So so even if, just so everyone's clear, so even if you adopted the, amended the motion to adopt the, have the effective date of the ordinance as January 31st, the way the policy is currently drafted in the packet still allows for full vaccination by June 30th of 2022. Just so you, I just want to make sure everybody's clear on those so, those so, dates and so how then they, they would have to amend the policy also. No, say, well, it I depends on what on what their the desired outcome is. Right. If you could have this ordinance effective today and give people until yeah. June 30th of 20, 2022 to get vaccinated, th that's how the policy is drafted. So I, I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page in terms of what's before you and what's being discussed. And I believe uh, if somebody is not vaccinated, they needed to get two vaccination shots to be fully vaccinated. I don't know that the booster counts yet, but there's a delay of 21 days to 42 days, right? So if we said January 31st, right, then that would mean 21 days between the vaccines, right? So then to get the first one would have to be by the seventh or something, right? So it says in the policy, it states that the f initial dose of, so if it's Pfizer or Moderna, the first full dose would have to be received by that June 30th oh, date. okay. And then there's, Thank correct. you for correcting me. And then there's 30 days thereafter to receive the second. I'm not terribly clear. If I wanted to amend it, how do I do that? <laughs> well, but uh, Sean made the motion, right? Correct. So then Sean would have to do it. Now, as it is, Sean doesn't have to do it, and it could be voted down if... Or, know, or Trustee Matt could make a substitute motion, but it's a, so there's different parliamentary ways to do it, one of which is to have Trustee Kennedy amend his motion. One, another would be for uh, Trustee Matt to make a substitute motion. Um, both would be in order. So I would make a motion to pass ordinance 2021-19 an ordinance establishing COVID-19 vaccination policy for the village with the amendment of the first vaccination dose to be administered by January 31st of 2022. That's the change. I'm not sure if that's... <laughs> well, January 31st. And then you would still, pursuant to the policy, still be allowing until that June date for the vac, for either the initial dose or the full, full Johnson & Johnson dose. That's, that's the interplay of the dates. So, so there, the ordinance that's adopting the, that's approving the policy has an effective date in it, right? So that's number one. And number two, the policy itself has a vaccination date, which is, which 
currently is the same date, but can be different. So you're saying that based on what the board is saying, that the effective date would be changed, changed to January 31st, 2022, not changing the policy vaccination date of June 30th, 2022. Correct. Okay. Or you could change both, right? I mean, you have sure. the options to right. do whatever. Yeah, I'm just giving you the v motion, the vehicles by which to get there. Well, I, I, so I'll open it up to the board. Again, uh, obviously, I think we're all on the same page of wanting this to pass. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me to go from all the way out to June 30th. Because again, the collective bargaining only affects a certain handful. We're talking about everybody else in the village have everybody done sooner than later and let everything else work out in the wash. So changing, Pat just did, so I would change the effective date and the policy vaccination date. If, if that's Sean, your, there's if, some le legal issues that John was referencing in terms of somewhat of a uh, uncertain ground that we were getting into. Uh, it. Uh, uh, by keeping the, the dates that we have the same, it establishes the policy where the village wants to go, but it gives us enough time to maneuver if we need to do that. Well, but I, I agree, but I thought uh, what I picked up from Pat earlier, too, is we could always change this. And we can change it later. Yeah. I mean, we could change it at the next meeting. Right. But uh, if we pass it as it is today, then we'll just keep the dates as uh, staff has originally written it. And if we want to change any of the dates, then that could be a separate su separate discussion uh, on that. I, I know, well, I believe um, we've talked about in the past whether we want to be the trendsetter or the leader of the pack uh, as far as the municipalities. And I think that goes to Charlie's point um, by the later date and I think John said that he has the June 30th, but the state made it June 1st, right? So uh, I'm, my concern would be, you know, being the lead if we make it too aggressive. Uh, I know in our area, we've said Countryside has done it, but I don't know that other municipalities have done that, right, in our area. Um, I, I don't know of any others. So, you know, do we want to be a leader in that and all that goes with being a leader? Well, I give, this gives us an opportunity to put it on the books as written and uh, come back in the December meeting uh, with information in terms of which dates we're talking about changing and maybe by then we'll have a little more information as to how Countryside and other municipalities are doing as well. So right. to, to answer the earlier question was, um, I'm in favor of keeping it as uh, the motion is originally made. As am I. But again, Sean, I know you're struggling with what to do and, uh, you know. Well, because this clearly is a hot topic. I mean, this is not an easy ordinance that we have in front of us, you know, not to make fun of a shed, but it's not in the same regard as a shed. I mean, this is... Um, literally life and death in some cases that we're talking about. So um, I think to, to what Charlie just brought up and what Pat had brought up earlier, since we have the ability later on that more time, seeing where the, the state comes down, seeing where other municipalities in the area come down, we could always make changes later on. So I think with that, leaving it as I originally made a motion for is probably where I will land for right now. So no changes. So I would love to be the leader of the pack. I never believe in uh, not being in the forefront, um, but I understand that there are probably financial implications if we're the leader of the pack. Um, and that gives me pause, uh, which I don't like, but um, I guess I uh, guess I'm gonna have to do it for our budget sake. So I'll go along with the June date with the caveat that if we get more information, we can change it. Well, and one other option, I don't think this is what you guys want, but we could continue this. We don't have to make a decision tonight. I think it's important we do. I agree. Okay, so Sean, do you wanna keep your motion as is? Yes, sir. 
Okay, any other comments? Oh, I thought you were pushing your button, Charlie. Okay, uh, Clerk Allison, could we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, sir. So, Trustee Kennedy. Aye. Armstrong. Trustee Donnersberger. Aye. Trustee Eck. Aye. Trustee Farrell Mayer. Aye. And Trustee Metz. Aye. And again, um, an absent for Trustee O'Loughlin. All right, that motion has been approved. Last item under new business is a smoke signals discussion. Um, after the last meeting, I have heard from a couple um, trustees and I had uh, discussions. Uh, there were questions and I have questions and I'm hoping uh, that the communications committee tonight can help um, either clarify or help set the direction on the future of the smoke signals. Um, so I guess I would ask, you know, the communications committee to give their vision. Uh, I think what was said last meeting was uh, the board approved to go monthly for approximately eight months. Uh, and then at that point it would be discontinued. And I guess what happens when it's discontinued is at least the question I have and I'll let any other board members ask their questions. Is your microphone? Yeah, it is. Okay, thank you. Uh, this, the committee is scheduled to meet this week, and I would like to have a chance to, um, Eileen and I are on the committee, but there are other members who I would like to have weigh in. And I think the idea is that beginning with the new year, um, it, it is made clear in the publication that it will be published until June in a written format. And after that, um, we really haven't gotten that far. My thought is that is we should, it should go online. Um, and continue as an online publication as a place where it's a community newsletter, not just business, uh, where people can send in uh, community events, photographs, notifications, but we have not firmed that up yet. Um, so that's where the committee stands. But we are meeting this week. I agree with Rita, and um, I think there's a lot of things the committee needs to discuss. I do have to say, though, the layout of that newsletter is wonderful. It's so much nicer than it, you know, it's just, it, she's doing a good job. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Lisa is in the back. Oh, where is she? Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. <laughs> uh, I would ask that um, the committee, before uh, saying in January that it will be ending, you know, work out what will be happening, right? And I, I'm assuming you are. Uh, and then, of course, let the board know uh, what that plan is. Um, like I had said uh, in the mayor's report, I've heard from residents, uh, we heard from Sharon, uh, that there are people that like the printed version, and I think we've heard uh, seniors, uh, maybe um, Wilshire Green residents, I know that's not the only place, but uh, seniors like it, and I know historically I have said I'd love to stop printing the smoke signals, but that went along with having people signed up to receive either text alerts or email alerts, right? So I'm concerned that if we don't have enough people signed up, then we would be, you know, stopping something and a big or a chunk of our residents wouldn't have access to that. My recollection from the last board meeting is that um, several board members are really reluctant to fund a continued um, smoke signals and so it becomes a question of funding if it's not there we can't continue with the written publication yeah, for me it's not the funding itself it's excessive funding having monthly smoke signals and spending an extra how many dollars was it Tom from uh, roughly 25,000 yeah to me that just doesn't seem necessary uh, so are you saying you you were in favor of a smoke signals or you are in favor I'm in favor of keeping it quarterly. Hey, um, for the two trustees that are on the communi communication committee, um, have you reached out to other villages to find out how they disseminate information to their towns? Rather than, re re you know, I'm, I'm in favor of pirating somebody else's, you know, we're talking about cameras. There's so many communities in the area that have the cameras. 
I'm sure the chief has gotten a lot of his information from those. So who else? Tom is holding up is that countryside. Yep, Andy. Uh, yeah, re just really quickly. So I don't have it in front of me, but I have uh, in preparation for next week's meeting. I have been gathering um, near nearby municipalities and how exactly they handle their newsletters. And from just the top of my head, it varies. It varies a lot. Um, so I think that's uh, something the committee will have to to weigh the options and uh, make a decision. So. In my role here, I get countryside in the mail and I get North Riverside in the mail. Yep. Uh, one more question. Um, was this discussed or is it something that I, I dreamt? Well, because I understand what, what Rita, um, there is a portion of our community that likes it, right? That likes to get this. Yes. Was there talk about printing in house and leaving? 20, 30 copies at each one of the condominium buildings, 20, 30 copies here for those people to still get hard copies, but greatly reducing the overall printing of it year in and year out? Is, is Not that to my recollection. I guess then the issue becomes, what about people in the single family homes that well, don't, you know, I mean, one of the people that was very vocal here, it was because her mother was a, in her 90s and, you know, wasn't on the internet and couldn't get access or didn't use the internet. So, um, but that's something, you know, we could think about. Well, my recollection is, I think it was you, Tom, mentioned that the smoke signals was put out at one of, I don't know if it was Wilshire or Green or wherever, and people were not picking it up. They weren't seeing it. Maybe it wasn't in the right spot. I don't know. Was that I, you? I think that's an issue that we need to work through with the post office in that, um, we're paying for every door direct mail and the postman is leaving a stack on the counter and I believe they need to do it in every mailbox. I'm not sure and I think John's ready to jump in. We did have conversations with the postmaster that we're paying for it and we expect it in every mailbox. We have not heard back from the, the Wilshire buildings about whether or not that has happened yet or not. But yeah, that is an issue, and I think that's been going on for a while. It's not a new thing. And I did have conversations with the postal carrier that it should be going in every box. All right, any other questions or comments? So the committee's having a meeting, so then maybe we could hear an update at the next board meeting? Yes, we can issue a report to the board in Thank the meantime. You. Thank you. Anything else on that? Okay, I don't hear any others. This is near the end of the meeting where we do uh, reports. Uh, trustees, uh, Charlie, I will start with you. Anything to report? Uh, no, planning and zoning was uh, our topic today in regards to the sheds, and uh, that's, that will be a continuing uh, effort uh, going forward for several meetings, I believe. Thank you. Rita? No additional report. Thank you. Chris? Uh, did you want to know anything about the Finance Committee, Tom? <laughs> yeah, please. Okay. Why is that important or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the uh, Finance Committee will be having the first meeting uh, November 30th. Uh, anybody is welcome to come. Um, members include uh, a couple of trustees. The mayor is there, the administrator, our finance director, uh, Elia Garbat, uh, Maureen Garcia, our tr treasurer. Uh, we have a couple of community members as well. And... We discussed the, uh, the budget uh, where we're at, it's the six month mark, um, see how we're doing, um, see if we're coming in, uh, what's been projected, um, let's see if we're over or under wherever we're at, and we start developing the budget for the coming fiscal year. So we'll have several meetings after that. Uh, we, um, what am I missing here? When, when do we get done with the budget? We get done, uh, is it March? Uh, oh, you pass the final version at the April meeting. Yes. So we have kind of a pre-version in March, and then we approve it in April. Oh. Is that right? No, sir. Uh, we have <laughs> uh, a very informal presentation in January, the first reading in February. At the March meeting, we have the second reading and public hearing, and then we adopt it at the April meeting. That was the detail I was looking for. Wonderful. Great. Um, and for the board, I would say uh, one of the finance committee's uh, objectives is to try to determine, I don't know if the right term is discretionary money, but board goals money. Um, 
So I would ask the board to be thinking about what your goals are this year. And we kind of work, not this year, but for next year, next budget year. Um, in the next few months, we'll start to gather the list. And then at some point we will prioritize the goals and whether it's one or three or five, whatever. Uh, and then we need to make sure that what we prioritize, what you prioritize, uh, gets put into the budget. So it, it's, uh, there is no set uh, date on that, but part of it is the finance committee to say, um, make up a number, we have $100,000, and then the board to figure out how to allocate that or spend that 100000 if we want, or if you want. So that's coming up. Chris, anything else? I know I added on. 6 p.m. Uh, November 30th, and... It's right here? And it's, an, it's right here, it's an open meeting. Thank you. There will be an agenda published ahead of time. Anything else? That's it. Thank you. Sean? Um, yeah, to, uh, just sort of kind of on a personal note. Um, yesterday, I put a phone call out to our own Public Works, Justin Fuller, to wish him a happy 246th year of the Marine Corps. Mm. I didn't know Officer Gardner, so I will extend the same uh, celebration wishes to you. It being Veterans Day, John DeRocher, our own, um, and anybody else that Chief served, Selter. Chief Selter, anybody else in the room that served, thank you. Um, and Justin notified me that he became a grandfather on Tuesday. Yeah. So if anybody sees Justin out there driving around in his pickup truck for the village, <laughs> make sure you rub it in that he's a grandfather at, I think he said 42 years old, so. Uh, thank you for doing that, Sean, and I was negligent in uh, saying that, so thank you for bringing up Veterans Day. Eileen? Uh, the Economic Development Committee has been fairly active. Uh, we, as I mentioned before, need to work with the owners that are already up there, and we're trying to do that. Uh, we went out, uh, was it last week, with um, Passion Construction Company. They're taking a look at it, the, f the facade for Indian Head Plaza, which is the strip mall. Um, they're going to come back next week, I hope, with some estimates on the facade and they're gonna break it out for us so that like the, fa the faucet would be different, the signs would be a different quote, uh, the poles would be a different quote so that we can pick and choose what we want done and maybe do it over time rather than all at once because it's obviously not going to, um, it's gonna be a lot of money. Uh, it, at the same time, we're looking into financing for it uh, and um, that might be one of my goals, my big goal. And uh, some of the committee members are reaching out to businesses in the area to see if we can attract them up there. So we're working hard, and fingers crossed we can do something. A, a question about that. So I missed that meeting. Uh, thank you for doing that. So you talked with this uh, construction company about a facade for Indian Head Plaza itself, correct? Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, Village Clerk. Anything to report? No report. Village treasurer? No report. Village attorney? No report. Sir. Village administrator? Um, a couple things. One, um, if you go on our website, on the very front page, you can have a link to... Sorry, my microphone was not on. Um, on our goals page, on our website, there's a link on the very front page of our website where you can click on and see where we are as, as a village with the goals that the board established for the village at the onset of the fiscal year of May 1st. Um, one of the goals coming up is uh, staff is getting ready to make a recommendation and we'll route this through the communications committee about revamping our website. We've had our website for about five years now and I think the look is a little becoming a little dated so we're looking at input on how we can make the website a little bit more appealing. Um, and Andy will be talking about the website update um, under his report. Anything else? Yes. Um, I don't know if you know this, but uh, with the census, the new census numbers finally came out ha and have been certified by the state of Illinois. The official population of the village of Indian Head Park is 4,065, up from 3,809 10 years ago. Uh, this means about another $55,000 a year to the village in state funding so thank you all okay whatever the board wants um 
And that is the my report. John, was the updating and reporting on the goals, was that one of the goals from yes, last it year? Was. <laughs> so thank you for doing that. Okay, Andy, Assistant Village Administrator. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, not, a, not a lot, just a few things. So uh, November 1st was our first leaf vacuuming uh, date. That It went pretty smoothly. There were not a lot of leaves. They were in and out pretty quickly. Uh, I would put the announcement out right now. Next week, uh, November 15th, is the second pass of leaf vacuuming. Please, all residents, have the leaves raked out there before Monday morning, morning, just to be safe. Um, Sunday afternoon, get them out there. And then starting Monday, SBC will be going through and uh, vacuuming them up. And I, can you remind residents where the leaves should go? Yes, I will. They are, the leaves should be um, raked up to the curb, but not in the street. Uh, it's important you try to get them as close to the curb as possible, but if they're in the street, it causes drainage issues and other issues like that. Uh, if you are a homeowner that, for whatever reason, you have a limited front yard, uh, then we would encourage you to rake them to uh, the end of your driveway. And For those homes that have a ditch, uh, yeah, what do you yeah. do there? Uh, for the homes that have a ditch, uh, if you could rake it to the in the driveway, or if you can kind of pile it up next to the curb um but not in the street that that's why but not in the street or not in the ditch is that what yes we, yes we, if we can get it right next to it or in the driveway that is ideal uh, and that's it for leaf vacuuming um please can take I it another question yeah. about do you have any um data how many loads you said they were in and out pretty quick i mean i know there weren't many leaves you know we don't have that yet but once the month is done then we will have the data from them about all the all the passes so all right again so the leaves need to be out by when monday morning uh, 6 a.m to be safe and that's the 15th yes and same for the end of the month yes that same for the uh 29th which will be the uh, final pass through start date. Thank you. And that's it for leaf vacuuming. Um, my other update, uh, I guess, res regarding the website first, uh, we we are slated for a uh, kind of a makeover of the website this winter with Civic Plus, which is our provider. Uh, we will be looking to get some input and recommendations from the communications committee next week on that. Uh, and that's pretty much it for that. Uh, the final thing I would like to provide an update on is simplicity. Now, this is a mobile app uh, that the village has uh, kind of partnered with, and it's an effort to, uh, is to provide another avenue for providing information to residents. Unfortunately, we have had limited sign-up for the website emails and alerts, uh, so we're, our hope is that with the mobile app, maybe people don't want to get emails. Uh, it's much easier just to get a notification that you can choose to ignore or not. Um, like the website, you can choose which categories to sign up for. And signing up for the app is completely free for residents. And it's also a free service for the village uh, in exchange for providing feedback to the developer. So I would encourage residents who are looking to receive updates, uh, but maybe don't want to fill up their email to, to sign up for Simplicity. And they, uh, the developer, will be at the communications committee meeting next week uh, to give the committee um, kind of a rundown of the app as well. Uh, if I can go back to the website update, um, are we paying for a refresh as part of our maintenance? It's so it's included. It's included in the licensing for the website. So. And I want to give a quick shout out to uh, Heidi Lopez, who worked um, very hard on the website that we have now. She spent countless hours um, doing all kinds of work on that project. So Heidi, if you're out there, thank you. Uh, John, department heads? I have nothing scheduled for tonight. All right, thank you. Um, last on the agenda is public comments. Same thing, if you wanna come to the podium. Good evening, everybody again. As police officers, we work jobs, and we look forward to doing our careers because we have a, a calling to serve and protect. And at the end of our careers, we look forward to the pensions that we receive to be taken care of for security for our family. Uh, this vaccine policy, um, as I 
heard your discussion, nobody talked about how many people are vaccinated or not vaccinated. The entire village, from my knowledge, and I'm not including myself because I'm not looking to do a 20 year career at the village here, I'll be 83 and I'm not looking to work that long. But we have two people in the village full time that aren't vaccinated. My understanding is one in the police department, one in public works. And I understand the one in public works will be forced. He will get it if it means he's got to keep his job. So really you're talking about one full time employee in the entire village. And I have a couple part time officers who work a handful of days that aren't vaccinated. And as he sits here today and as you discuss well, if you want to work here, get the vaccine. I, I understand your stance. But you're looking at a man that we've spent thousands and thousands of dollars of training who is our armorer, who we all know about the Maserati case uh, that we just had. This man pulled a fingerprint off the outside of the car and got us a suspect, and we're going to be arresting somebody for that. This is a man who's dedicated 16 years of his life to this village who a year ago, police, fire, medical people, we were heroes for coming to work. Now, are, are we disposable now just because we don't get a shot? You don't know the stress that he's offered. You don't know the sleepless nights he's been having for the last month. His wife is crying at home because he's not a 26-year-old man that can go out and get another job. He's a man that's got 16 years and was hoping to have a future here at Indian Head Park and a pension for the rest of his life when he retires. But in person in his mid-40s, what is he going to do? He can't go to another police department. He's too old. Um, I, I am asking the village to really, I, I don't know how much everybody's researched the pros and the cons to the vaccine. That's your business. I would certainly hope that you would research your own and just not listen to people and what they say because every argument that I heard posed for it, I could give you an argument against and I would just ask that the board would consider either number one, just grandfather him in. There has been no issues here. Back several months ago when we dropped them, the governor dropped the mask, everybody was running around here with no mask on because you didn't have to wear one. There was no issues. There are no issues here. We haven't had any issues. Eddie, 32 years, got COVID a year and a half ago, was out for two months in the hospital for over, I don't know how long, a week, on a respirator, recovered and came back to work again. And now you're looking at saying goodbye just because they don't get a shot. I'm sorry, I don't understand it. His future is on the line here. And um, I would just ask that you would consider either grandfathering him in or a weekly COVID test. Most places that are re requiring this, they also give an option for those that you go for a weekly COVID test. Why not a weekly COVID test? Um, I'm something, but to sit there and look at him right now and say, Sorry, Chris, you don't have a job unless you go get the shot. I'm sorry, I, I, I don't understand it. So I, I may lose my job over this, I, I don't know, but I'm just, I, I can't sit here as a chief of police. And I know, and I've talked to him and know the stress and he's been going through. And I would just ask that you guys would maybe consider that at least, and then anybody in the future that gets hired has to have the vaccine. But I'm just, don't do that to him, please don't. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I wrote down in the beginning. Sean, is your uh, microphone? Is, I don't know okay. why we're having problems tonight. Maybe it's the mask. Uh, Chris, I believe when you made your statement earlier, um, one of the things you said was a, a sit down that you would be open to. I, I wrote that down and I will be following up with you. I would like to have a, a conversation. And I will say this to everybody, and I'll, I'll say it to you when we sit down. This is not personal. This is not directed at you. This is directed at the entirety of the village, the entirety of the population of the village. It's, it's, it's all about the virus. For me personally, it has nothing to do with any one individual. So um, I will be reaching out to you to sit down. I will share my thoughts. and. To Chief, if that's something that you would like to do as well, I'm more than happy. Um, I, as I said before, I, I live with a healthcare professional who recently. Re, re, uh, uh, yeah, can we? All right. Ma'am, there's, there's a time to talk. Please sit down. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not doing this to pick a fight. I'm doing this no, to, to no. give you an idea where I come from. Um, she 
recently was on the, not allowed to bury three of her family members because it was brought into a household. And her 95-year-old grandmother, who lived with one of the daughters that died, was displaced from the only residence that she had ever lived in, to Milwaukee. So it's not personal to you directly, but it's very personal to me how I feel about this. And I have been following the science from day one. Um, and I, again, am more than happy to sit down and discuss this one-on-one -on -one with you. Um, at your earliest convenience. So. Okay, I'd like to jump in. I know this is a um, emotional issue um, and there may be two sides to this. Uh, there may be 18 sides, but I'd like to keep the visitor comments going. Um, so I see three people up. Uh, I don't know if you all wanna speak. Jim, I think you're closest. Yeah. I, just, I just have to make a comment myself. Um, I'm a very recent retiree from the Illinois State Police, 23 years. I did 10 years in the military. I've worked with your officers in this room. I've helped out your officers in this room. I've worked the biggest case Indian Head Park had in this room, over here with Kelly. I met Chris a long time ago. Guy bends over backwards for you. I'm a firm believer in science. My sister's a neonatologist. She explains everything. I want to research something, I shut Google down. How many members of the board went to Northwestern, went to LaGrange, talked to the doctors? Or did we do all our research with Bing and Google? Otherwise, it's just, you shake your heads, do whatever you want. But you know what, I'm also, I'm a, I'm John, a, I'm, a, I'm, John, a, I'm, I'm <laughs> if you don't mind. You know what, going, I believe yeah. in the, I'm gonna tell you, I believe in the science. Do we have an issue, we have a problem? Yeah, we do. I also believe in freedom of choice. If you don't want to get it, you don't got to get it. Now, Chris is willing not to get a shot. I commend you, Chris. Hey, Chris, how many calls are you going to turn down going into a house? That's right. Everybody in that house have a COVID shot? So Chris is putting his life on the line. And I get emotional about it. Because you know what? Being an Illinois State Trooper or a former Illinois State Trooper, the guys who catch COVID are the guys that got vaccinated. Just because you're vaccinated doesn't mean you're not going to catch COVID. Doesn't mean you're going to be on a respirator. Doesn't mean you're going to die. It's like the flu. We all get, I get flu shots. I got the flu the last four years. That's just the whole thing. It is a touchy subject. But to let this guy go, a guy that I've worked with, the guy that I, I have we ever had a beer? Have we ever, do you ever invite me? If, yeah, have we ever, we had I, conversations over we've had over coffee, that's it. But you, you can't let a guy go who's got 16 years wanting to knock on anyone's door, help him out. Hey, come to my house. Anytime he comes to my house, I don't care if he has COVID. Just like your fire department. My house is on fire. Can I see your COVID card before you start putting my fire out? It's, it's insane. Give him the test. Currently, I work for NBC. I get tested every month or every, every week on Monday. I don't have COVID. I get to work. That's just how it is. These tests are simple. You can go to Walgreens and get one for 19 bucks, too. You can, te you can, you can get, it, get tested every week right here at Walgreens. So just think hard about it. I know we're emotional about it. I know we get upset. We live with this. We live with that. But you know what? You have to realize the information you're getting from someone you live with is biased. Who knows? I want to remind you the three minutes. Sorry, okay, I don't okay. want to cut so you know, off. But we just, we again, just, I think we, just we could all say, talk all Science night. works. Personal choice works. We just got to, we can't let somebody go because of it. Thank you, Jim. Right. Nick, Chris, I think they were standing up before you, so you'll be Is it all right? Absolutely. You'll be up next. I, I'll, be, I'll try and be as brief as possible. Um, wow, what a night. I wish there was more people here. Um, I, too, believe in the freedom of choice. We don't know people's medical positions. We don't know their history, their rationale for not taking this. Sean made a comment, you know, it's no shed. I'm going to tell you, Sean, how many shed committees did we have? You guys voted on this, and it rolled off your sleeve, and then you went into your newsletter. Shame on all of you. There was no deep discussion about, I, only, I didn't know there was only one officer. What's your contingency plan if you get a mass call off? Like Southwest Airlines, like Chicago Police, like Chicago Fire. You had no discussion about it. Shame on all of you. 
You did not protect the interests of the constituents of this town tonight. You didn't even consider Nick, if it. If I could ask you, keep and your it's voice not right. down. If I'll, I could I'll, ask. I'll comment on That's fine. Thank you. But it's wrong. You guys did a very wrong thing tonight by not having a deeper, meaningful dialogue around this. You told everybody in here that as a political body, you're going to tell them that you're going to put a needle in them on something they may not agree. Now, I live in a divided house with my wife. She's not, I am, but I believe in the choice. And she has her medical reasons for not doing that. It's not right. What you did is so beyond wrong. Now, I have one question. Who's up for re-election? Uh, Who's up for re-election in 2022? Can we raise hands? You guys owe me a hand. Who's up for re-election? Uh, the way it works, 24? nobody... Yeah, 2023, there will be half the trustees and the mayor position and will what be you've, up. What you've told these people here tonight and hopefully everybody watching, doesn't matter. You voted. You're not going to change your vote. We all know the position. You're not going to extend this. You're not going to kick the can down the road. You're afraid to be different. You said you wanted to lead. You want to lead? Lead with choice. You're uh, not different. All right, you I just want to path. remind you of the, the three minutes. One. Thank My three minutes is fine. I hope you guys uh, re really, really reconsider this. You made a horrible mistake in tonight. The ordinance. There are provisions in the ordinance for medical exemptions. I just want to make that clarified. And I believe everybody. a religious exemption as well. All right, Chris. Thank Trustee you. Kennedy, I don't, I don't take it personally. It's not personal. And for me, and to, I understand that COVID hit your, your home, and I'm very sorry for that. I lost my mother. It hit my home, too. Okay, my mother. I said at the beginning of my speech tonight, um, I just hope this doesn't fall on deaf ears. Well, obviously it has, and that's a shame because I trusted in the system. I trusted in small government where I could come and speak before our small leaders. I don't come into this room very often because it's not my job as a patrolman to have any influence on what happens here tonight. But tonight, you guys are telling me basically, yep, you can either succumb to our will or lose your career. Not a job. I can't go, go become another real estate agent in another agency. Thank Chief uh, Stelter for the things he said. I don't take it personally. I understand. I looked at it from your guys' point of view. I did. I tried very hard. And I understand in your hearts, you feel you are doing the right thing. And the first thing that came to my mind when I thought that was, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. For me, this is bigger than COVID. As Chief said, I haven't slept much in the past month because this has gone from a religious journey for myself through the very patriotic part of myself to me this is very much falls under the very fabrics that make up old glory i notice today is veterans day and you're telling a marine basically we're not i i hope that you guys were going to have a dialogue at least and that it would be voted in my speech i said you guys aren't even going to vote till next month but okay I guess it really didn't matter. You, you guys couldn't wait how fast to get it done. I said, please, just wait. Let's let the court set this out. People greater than ourselves, hopefully smarter than ourselves, in positions higher than the Indian Head Park Village. We can't do that. No, we, we've got to rush this through. And, and, and I'm sorry. And I'm sorry for that. And I, maybe, maybe, it could, maybe I'll get the jab. Maybe this isn't a government worth defending anymore. Maybe a Marine, a law enforcement officer for 16 years in this village, is watching freedom die. You know, when I joined the Marine Corps at the age of 18, I, you have glorious, glorious things of battlefields in your head. The battlefields are happening in this room and rooms just like it across this great country right now. And everyone's in such a rush because we're, we're afraid. I understand being afraid. Courage is being afraid and doing it anyway. The definition of. I'm sure my three minutes are up, but you, you guys voted so fast, you, you couldn't wait for it. Stop. Have a conversation. I'm more than, more than happy to have a dialogue with you, sir. As you can see, I hold this very, very, very personally to myself because for me, this is bigger than COVID. This is bigger than the loss of my mother. 
For me, this is everything that I've stood up for for my entire life. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Hi, my name's Jim. I just come up as a concerned citizen. I'm, I'm a retired 60-year-old man. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not a, I wasn't a first responder. Uh, I'm just a guy that uh, has feelings, all right? And, and for me, I, I look back at when, um, in, in the whole 60 years of my life, every single day, I entrusted my life to the first responders, right? I, I, they were, I entrusted that they were committed. I entrusted that they were caring for the safety of me, my family, my friends, my community. And, and we, we all trusted them to always make the right decisions. That's just the way it's been my whole life, all right? When uh, COVID hit, we put bigger expectations on our, on our first responders. We asked them to go into it, not knowing what this was all about, how bad it was going to get, right? And again, we've all been affected by it. I had COVID. I also have the shot. My wife had COVID. My wife does not have the shot. You know, that's, that's neither here nor there. The thing is about choice. And, and this man, and all these great men back here have make a, a commitment every, every single day to go out there, put their lives at risk for us, all right? And when they do that, you know, they have did it through this whole pandemic, never questioning they were there. When uh, people started rioting and looting, they had a target on their back. But what did they do? they still did the things that they needed to do to keep us safe and look over their shoulder because they don't know when they're gonna be shot in the back of the head. So we've allowed them for my whole life, and I would assume a hell of a lot longer, to make the right decisions that we should give them the opportunity to continue to make the right decisions without a mandate, all right? And that's, I mean, for me, you guys made your decision. You got dates out there of June. If this was this mandate was so dire, why are we waiting till June to make it effective? Why hasn't it been made two months ago when, when Biden made the, the, the statement? You know, I mean, to me, we're talking about science and all this other stuff, and I'm not here to judge anybody's beliefs. All I'm saying is we're not judging your beliefs, but, but trust us. Trust these these people here, they're here for us. If without each one of these, for every person we lose on, on that team there, it lowers our safety. And on a man like that, from the things I've heard about him, you know, what, what can I say? I want that guy to save my life if it comes down to it. And I hope every one of you would too. So uh, thank, thank you, you for Jim. listening. Hi, I'm like Jim. Could you state your name? My name is Joe Mano. Uh, I'm also a concerned citizen, just like Jim. I'm a 60-year-old man, too. I've sit here tonight. Um, I've been a police officer before. Uh, after my tour of duty in law enforcement, I chose to go to school, get my master's degree in business, and went to go work for a gas utility company uh, where I retired from. As all, you all know, I wear NICOR gas. That's where I retired from. But in all my years, sitting in a board meeting, sitting in meetings with uh, a lot of people, what I've seen tonight is a disgrace. What happened to all the heroes? Okay. You all sat here making a close judgment where I come from, in our meetings, we sat down, we took a look at the data. I keep hearing science. Science, what a cliche. You got that off the media. Let's follow the science. Did you bother looking at the science? Did you go and look at the data? Like that one gentleman said, or, or you picked up the Google or listened to channel 257 and 9. 
Talk to the doctors. Get the data. You talk about, you have people that are in your family that are medical. My daughter's a doctor. My brother's a doctor. They've been on the front lines. But shame on you to make a decision after this guy put his life on the line for 16 years. And you can't come across and do something about it? Y'all are, are old enough. Probably my age or, or a little older or a little younger. What happened to all the heroes who stood up? That goes back to the leadership. And one thing I learned in corporations is to be a leader, is to be front end of it, not leading from behind. And what I see from tonight is leading from behind. Talking about the masks, I've watched each and every one of you touch your masks. Masks are supposed to be sterile, and masks that are ones that are supposed to be good are the N95s. None of you are wearing them. You've been playing with your masks all night, putting your hands on your masks. They're contaminated. That's not following the science. So when you go and do your research, talk to the doctors, look at the data. You gave your kids shots. They did a, took a sample of a th couple thousand kids. You don't know what the long-term effects are. Nobody knows. But you put something in their arm, didn't you? I'm 60 years old. Whether I have long-term effects, I'm 60. Look at the data. Think before you make decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? <coughs> Real quick. Yeah, with the Illinois State Police, we don't have any mandates. Guess what? We survived. We're still going it. We're still 1,700 strong. If you get COVID, you get your 14 days off, you come back to work. That's just the whole thing. You want to be a leader? People choose. The people that have the right to choose if they want to get the shot or not. All right, thank you. Choice. All right. And as far, and as far as the chief about the, uh, on the separate subject with the, these cameras, we got to get them. We're behind that eight ball with it. And I know it's if you're not in law enforcement, right, we, it's, it's a very difficult thing to understand. But you got to get the you got to get these cameras in. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, would somebody like to make a motion? I'd love to make a motion to go to closed session for the review of closed session minutes per 5 ILCS 120-2C21, collective bargaining 5 ILCS 120-2C2, and personnel 5 ILCS 120-2 uh, C1 with no intention to return to open session. I'll second. Thank you, Chris and Sean. It's 9.37. Roll, roll call vote, please, Clerk Allison. Chris? I need to set him up. Trustee, Aye. Trustee Metz, thank you. Aye. Uh, Trustee Kennedy? Aye. Uh, Trustee Farrell Mayor? Aye. Trustee Eck? He just left the room. Oh, he did. Okay. Uh, Charlie? Charlie, we got a vote. Charlie? It doesn't have to be. Okay. All right. Very good. Trustee Donnersberger. Aye. Okay. All right. All right, that has been Thank approved. You. Adjourned. Yeah. Take a minute break. <laughs>